They say the ocean is the last unexplored frontier on Earth, a place where mysteries linger in the shadows of the deep. I used to laugh at that notion, having faced the most ruthless human enemies on the battlefield. But as I sit here, recounting this story, I know that the true terror lies beneath the waves. I'm Commander Jack Hammer Harris, a Navy SEAL with over two decades of service. I've led my team through hell and back, but nothing prepared us for what we faced off the coast of the Indian Ocean. Our mission began like any other. A routine briefing, but this time with a twist. The brass handed us a file on a missing research vessel, the Ocean Quest. Last known position, a newly discovered underwater cave system. The scientists on board had been investigating strange biological activity before their transmission went dark. Our orders were clear, find out what happened and, if necessary, neutralize any threats. Lieutenant Sarah Echo Evans, our marine biologist, was particularly intrigued. Her eyes lit up at the mention of unknown species and underwater caves. For the rest of us, it was just another mission, another potential threat to eliminate. We arrived at the site, a remote island with no signs of human habitation. The water was eerily calm, as if nature itself was holding its breath. We suited up, checked our gear, and launched our underwater drones to get a lay of the land. The drones transmitted images of intricate tunnels and glowing flora. Echo was mesmerized, but Chief Petty Officer Marcus Shark Bennett, our veteran diver, and I exchanged uneasy glances. Something felt off. As we dove deeper, the water grew colder and the light dimmer. The remains of the ocean quest loomed into view, torn apart by what seemed like unimaginable force. No bodies, just shreds of metal and equipment. We advanced cautiously, our lights cutting through the darkness. Strange sounds echoed through the tunnels, a mix of clicks and rumbles that set my teeth on edge. I felt we were being watched, and I wasn't the only one. Petty Officer First Class Luke Reef Reynolds, our tech specialist, muttered about shadows moving just beyond our lights. Our first encounter with the creature was brief but terrifying. Petty Officer Second Class Amy Waves Mitchell was tending to some equipment when a shadow darted towards her. She barely had time to react before something massive knocked her aside. We fired our weapons, but the creature was too fast, disappearing into the darkness. We regrouped, shaken but determined. Echo analyzed the creature's remains from its attack on Wave's gear, bioluminescent scales, razor-sharp teeth, and bioelectric capabilities. It was unlike anything documented, a true predator of the deep. As we pressed on, the creature's attacks grew bolder. It used the narrow tunnels to its advantage, striking swiftly and retreating into the darkness. We lost Reef in one such attack. His scream still haunts me. Desperation set in. We were outmatched and out of options. Echo proposed a risky plan, lure the creature into the deepest chamber and use our remaining explosives to collapse part of the cave. It was a gamble, but it was all we had. Setting the trap was a harrowing process. The creature seemed to sense our intentions, becoming more aggressive. Shark was taken during the setup, his last words urging us to finish the mission. With the explosives in place, we waited. The creature took the bait, charging into the chamber. We detonated the explosives, the shockwave nearly knocking us out. Rocks tumbled down, and the creature let out a deafening roar as it was buried. We surfaced, battered and traumatized. A naval vessel picked us up, and we were debriefed by higher authorities. They took our reports and the evidence, then warned us to keep quiet. There was more at play than we understood. Back on the mainland, the surviving team members struggled to cope. Echo delved deeper into her research, haunted by the creature's existence. Waves and I were left with the memories of our fallen comrades and the lingering question of what else lurked beneath the ocean's surface. Months later, I received a classified file, similar occurrences had been reported in other parts of the world. The cover-up was extensive, suggesting that our encounter was not unique. The ocean held more secrets, 
and we had merely scratched the surface. As I pen these words, I feel a chill run down my spine. The ocean is vast, and we are but intruders in its domain. The true terror lies in knowing that somewhere in the depths, predators still lurk, waiting for the right moment to strike again. The abyss is calling, and it's only a matter of time before another team answers. About a week or two after summer vacation started between my 8th and 9th grade years, my brother and I walked down into the woods not too far from our house, on the outskirts of Sandy, Oregon. There was a trail that was used by kids in the area to get down into the woods, and a little way off the trail, my brother and I had hauled a little wood and built a small platform about six feet up in the crook of a tree. That day, around noon, we were on that platform, shooting our BB gun at a tall stump that was just a little way downhill from where we were. My brother turned around as I was preparing to fire, and just as I was ready to shoot the BB gun, something with a human-like head passed right in front of the tall stump. The trees and brush obscured everything but the head, but I got a good look at it. It had brown fur over almost all of the head, but not dark brown, just a little darker than cinnamon color, with a kind of flat nose, and the hair and fur was not too long. It walked by and disappeared into the brush almost without making a sound, there was a very heavy bed of needles from the Douglas fur all over. It happened so suddenly and so fast that I didn't have a chance to get scared. I called my brother's name, and he turned in time to see some of the branches still swaying. We stood there and talked about it for a few minutes, then carefully went down to where it passed in front of me and figured that it had to have been about seven half feet tall. After this, I went to my former 8th grade science teacher, who happened to live in the neighborhood, this was a town of about 1200 at the time, and told him about it. He was very skeptical and gave me numerous things that he thought I had seen. He obviously didn't believe I had seen a Sasquatch and Bigfoot. Later that same day, around dusk, my brother and I were sitting on the trail, not too far from the tree fort where I had seen it earlier in the day, talking about it. Suddenly, I'm not sure what made him do it, but he looked over at the platform that we had built, about 20 to 30 yards away, and his face turned white as a ghost. I looked over there and saw the silhouette of a man looking at us, head and shoulders, from behind our tree fort. Since it was dusk, we weren't able to make out any features, just the outline. We both jumped up and ran the rest of the way home, scared half out of our wits. During the second sighting that day, the creature didn't seem anything but curious about us, but it still scared us. Two years later, I was down in the woods at almost midnight, I'd left something down there the previous day, and heard footsteps coming towards me in a huffing noise, almost like a horse blowing. I dropped my flashlight and ran the three quarters mile home in record time. We looked for footprints after the first sighting, but due to the ground cover, we found none. This story takes place in 2014, in the northern part of rural South Carolina. I am absolutely sure where it happened, I drove this route many times during that year. Very dark, very rural, and this particular stretch of road doesn't have very many houses. This incident happened not far from an old church also, no idea if relevant. I used to work at a tattoo shop, and lived with the owner. Our route home took us through the area described above. We'd usually get home fairly late, this night wasn't any different. In fairness I will say I had smoked some pot earlier, but I am a heavy smoker and it doesn't affect me horribly. I don't think the passenger had done any drugs or drank anything at all that day. We're driving home, I'm probably driving about 60 to 70, didn't like to go too fast cause of deer and wild hogs scared me quite often. We're talking about something, no idea what, I'm slightly glancing over to the right during the conversation as one does while driving. I notice something that seems to be running at the woods. Not unusual, often saw shit at the sides. However, I realize that it was still there at the second glance, 
which causes me to look and see what in the world seems to be still moving beside a speeding vehicle. As I turn my head to look, this form, which I can only describe as the very vague shape of a four-legged wolf-looking creature, but without any definition, runs ahead of the car, goes across the road and into the woods. As it crossed the road and my high beams shone on it, it seemed to absorb the light. No visible fur, no reflection in the eyes, nothing discernible beyond a sort of wolf-shaped blur that was the literal darkest black I've ever seen. This all happened in the span of maybe five or six seconds I'd guess. It startled me quite a bit, so I immediately say what the F was that? What did you see? I reply with the above description, to which my friend goes very quiet and only says tell his wife what I told him when we got home. I tell her, her face drops and she immediately looks shocked. Then they tell me my friend had seen it before with someone else, who denied seeing it. Same area. Same description. And he saw it too that night that I saw it, same exact thing. I have looked online, I have read local Carolina legends books, I have asked so many old people if they had any idea what it was and I can't find anything very convincing. There was one story on Reddit where someone mentioned a similar entity, described also as being a void black. Besides that, we are still stumped. One guy said maybe it was like a forest spirit or something? It doesn't fit any black dog things I've read. If anyone here has any ideas, please let me know. It wasn't really scary, nobody died right before or after we knew, and I didn't see it anymore after that night. We've all moved away now, but I still think about it all the time and I still have half a mind to go try to see it again. I just really want to know what we saw. My friend and I were driving to Powers from Gold Beach on a little used road called the Agnes and Gold Beach Highway. It was a shortcut through the woods. Our car broke down about 5 miles or so from Powers, and we walked, or rather, ran, out of the woods into Powers. Where we were able to call a tow truck and some other transportation to return to Gold Beach. We didn't have much time left by the time we got to town. My wife came and picked us up with our four-wheel drive blazer, and we proceeded to drive back to Gold Beach at about 1.30 in the morning. While walking out of the woods, my friend and I kept hearing what sounded like something in the brush alongside the road. We would stop to listen, and it would be silent. We were glad when we reached Powers. Anyway, while driving back with aircraft landing lights on our blazer, we saw a blue-eyed, smoky bluish-gray, very big thing standing in the ditch alongside the road. We all saw the eyes first, reflecting the bright light. I will never forget the long smoke-colored hair changing as the wind blew it around, and the blue eyes. We discussed turning around and looking at this thing again but thought better of it. People who live in that part of the world believe what we said about what we saw. Nowadays, I know what I saw and don't care what anyone else may think, it is not important to me. Activities of Witness S. We had just completed a long, long walk out of the woods, with no drugs, alcohol, or anything that would cloud our judgment. Description of creature, I know it wasn't Hulk Hogan in a monkey suit, but it was about that size or a little larger. Most noticeable were the blue eyes, or what appeared to be blue, and the smoky bluish-gray color. You could almost say that it was very pretty. Not scary like the drawing posted on this website. Strangely, none of us felt any fear at all. This thing was standing very still alongside the road. We were sitting in a full-size four-wheel drive and were looking at this thing straight in the eye. Remember, the ditch was about three feet deep or more that he was standing in. I have driven the back roads in this part of the world and at times thought I saw things that were a little strange. You didn't have to think about this one, it was right there in plain sight. I actually saw something like Dogman while driving down a mountain road at night. My daughter and I were on our way to a casino in Calusa, Cali, traveling on the 20 going south from Clear Lake, Cali. Anyone familiar with that road knows it is very windy, very dark, and a long way down. 
approximately halfway down the mountain, to our surprise, we saw a huge wolf that looked like it was trying to cloak itself. The outline of the wolf was shimmering and wavy, yet it was clear as day that it was a wolf. It was fast and seriously huge, disappearing into the woods in under 30 seconds. We both said, did you see that? There is no doubt about what we saw. We just had no idea that wolves, or at least this one, could cloak themselves. Ever since I was a baby, I was a magnet for the paranormal, ghosts, demons, and whatever lies in between. I always felt something watching me 24-7. I'm not sure when it started, but it was sometime around when I was 6 years old. I had two dogs at the time and, of course, would let them out whenever I was home from school and during the night. Everything was normal until I started seeing this thing in the back corner of my backyard every single night. It was pretty large and looked like my dog, but it would just stand there and stare at me with glowing red eyes. It had the form of a large dog, almost coyote-like. Every night when I took my dogs out, it would be there, watching me. It filled me with so much terror and dread whenever I saw it. I would be frozen in fear. It was so bad that I wouldn't take my dogs outside alone anymore. I tried showing my dad and pointing at it, yet he saw nothing. Neither he nor my mom believed me, which drove me crazy. It terrified my younger self due to its eerie resemblance to my current dog. I could see its facial expressions, body, and the way it moved. Sometimes the thing would even pace around in the corner of my yard, but it never left that spot. I only ever saw it at night, during the day, it would disappear. It would stare at me even through the windows and blinds as if it knew exactly where and when I was going to see it. This went on for years, all the way until intermediate school, fifth grade. I should also add that my dogs never seemed to react to it. Now that I'm older, I have barely seen it but I wanted to ask if anyone had an idea of what this was. This dog-like thing terrorized me throughout my childhood, and I really want to know what it was. Both these things happened in New Mexico in roughly the same place. Driving from Belen to Mountain Air, there's a long, like almost an hour, of straight flat road called Becker Flats. Becker Flats has kind of a local reputation for weird shit. Drug smugglers land planes on the highway there, strange animals are spotted, UFOs, and there's a ranch called Mountain Shadows off the flats that has a lot of rumors about it that I'm sure are not true, just your basic satanic panic bullshit. Still, in 1990, I was driving across Becker Flats about 9pm and an ant the size of a shoebox ran out into the road. It was clearly an ant, six legs, three body sections, and antennae. It was just about 14 inches long. I was going about 70 miles per hour with the high beams on, it stopped when the light hit it, and I didn't have time to swerve, both front and rear tires hit it and the car lifted up rather than crushing it, making a tremendous noise like I had gone over a speed bump at 70. Scared the piss out of me. Another time, Several months later, I was in about the same place, but right after sunset. About 7 o'clock. The spot where this occurred was at least still a 30-minute drive from my destination, Mountain Air, where I lived. I passed a guy walking on the side of the highway the same direction I was going. It was so unusual to see a pedestrian that I slowed down to get a look at him. He was a Native American, most likely a Navajo, with long hair in a bun a red bandana tied around his forehead like a sweatband. And wearing jeans, a blue t-shirt, and an old army field jacket, just OD green with no camouflage pattern, like Vietnam era, with lighter sections on the sleeves where there clearly used to be three stripes like a sergeant. He was wearing black pointy-toed cowboy boots and a silver concho belt. I thought huh, that's odd and kept driving. When I got to town a half an hour later, I passed the mountain air cantina on the main drag, and the same guy was pulling open the door to walk inside. The speed limit on the drag is 30, so I was going very slow and could get a good look at him. 
exact same bandana, belt, boots, and jacket. As I crept past, he turned and looked right in my eyes and held the gaze until I was gone. No other cars had passed me on the way to town, and even if he had hitched a ride right after I saw him on the flats, there was no way he could have gotten there first, unless he was in a plane. I told some friends about it in case they knew the guy, and they said I should be careful for a while, as I had been marked by a skinwalker. I thought that was bullshit, but asked a couple other guys I knew who were Navajo and Zuni about the guy and told them what I saw, and they said the same thing, except they also said to never mention it again. I was on a walk around midnight, so about an hour ago from writing this, on a bike trail by a highway in Kansas, and I saw a strange creature. It was on the side of the sidewalk. I was listening to music and heard some kind of crunch behind me as I was walking. I turned around, and there was this thing about a foot tall staring right at me with yellow eyes that were reflecting some light from a car on the highway. I swear it was looking directly at me. I did a U-turn and ran the hell out of there because one, I had no clue what it was and still have no idea, and two, what was that crunch? I think it might have come from the woods on the opposite side of the highway, but it's late spring, almost summer, so it couldn't have been any dry leaves. It also rained not long ago, so the grass wouldn't have crunched like that. The thing had no distinguishable features. I saw it for only a second before I bolted, but it didn't have a neck, arms, or legs, just stubby little feet holding it up. It was like a fat pill standing upright. It didn't have a back or anything remotely human-like. It was too small to be a skinwalker, too big to be a weird bug. What the hell did I encounter? I'm completely sober, well-rested, and all that. I decided to go walking around town because I'm overweight and like walking, but the summer is too hot during the daytime, so I went at night. I used to have this friend who lived near me, and we would hang out often. Somehow, we got on the topic of my grandparents' house and how we both just knew there was something weird going on with it. They told me about a time when they and their sister were driving past my grandparents' house and saw this black creature come crawling out of the woods behind the house. I remember feeling a wave of dread because I had seen that exact same creature. The scary part is that I had seen it multiple times. Once, I saw it shoot past the back patio window when I was probably 10 years old. My mom was next to me. I thought it was my black pit bull that was outside. I wondered what she was doing out of the gated area we had set up outside since my grandparents didn't want our dogs inside. I went to look out the kitchen window, which had a direct line of sight to her kennel. When I looked out, she was in her gated area. A sense of fear ran through my body. Another time, when it was just my grandparents, my siblings, and I living at the house, I saw it again. Only this time, it made itself look like my little brother. My grandma, little brother, and I had just come home. It was just us at home. I was at the kitchen sink helping my grandma with something when I thought I saw my brother run past the kitchen window. I was confused because the color of his shirt was different and I could have sworn I saw him go to the bathroom. The most confusing part is that I would have heard him run past the window, but whatever this was didn't make a sound. Whenever someone runs past the windows, you can always hear them. So, I called out to him, asking if he was in the house, and both he and my grandma said he was. That same fear set in again. I told my grandma, and she said she had seen something walk to the back of the second garage we had and it looked like my uncle. She knew it wasn't him because he was at work that day. That friend I mentioned earlier told me that after I left, their sister saw something quickly crawl or run in their front yard the next morning. The friend also saw something in their house that looked like their cat, but they knew it wasn't because the cat was with them. The weird thing is that this creature moves really fast, you can only see it for a couple of seconds. It's been below freezing for a while now. 
We stop letting our mouser out because of it, but it seems like something, whatever it is, realized her pattern of behavior to letting her inside and it won't leave us alone. I thought my roommate's dad was messing with us when we got back from college for winter break, but he explained how he even walked outside to see what it was. If you've ever been around stray cats, especially those that need help, they always stay within sight of you. Whatever this thing is, it ran around the side of the house as he went outside and kept meowing, low and long, leading him to the old goat pen near the wood line. He never once saw it despite the fact that it triggered the motion lights around the house. I haven't seen or heard it until tonight which is why I'm typing this out. I have two large windows in my room, and I keep the blinds cracked a little for sun to come through for my plants. I've been sitting at my desk attempting to do prep for this upcoming semester and have had my swivel chair faced away from the window so I can keep an eye on my laptop as it played a video for background noise. I heard it in between the talking of the video. The meowing. It was low and distorted. Not like any cat I've ever heard, and it made my blood run cold. My window is a good 9 feet off the ground as we live on a hill. Whatever this thing is had its face against the glass or something because it sounded like it came from right behind me. I didn't look. I did manage to clear the entirety of my entire room in two massive leaps though. Right after this happened my roommate came out of her room and said that something was whimpering outside of her window. Like a dog upset that it's not getting what it wants from its owner. She's currently gathering eggshells and all her railroad spikes as I type this out. Her father is going to look for his trail cam when the sun comes up. Any advice would be appreciated. Everywhere we've looked online or asked for advice from at this point has basically resulted in sucks to suck don't go outside. If there are any non-paranormal explanations for this, that would be great too, because we won't know for sure until we get the trail camera up. Edited to update, hope that's okay, there has been a cougar spotted in the area apparently. I called in the wildlife resources line just to be sure and was informed by the lovely worker on the line after giving our location and approximate times of its possible appearances. It's managed to get into more public residential areas this afternoon. They're actively searching as this update is going out. Not sure if this is the culprit or not. Either way, all animals will remain in their respective enclosures and the neighbors down the way have also been informed so they could put their horses away. If it is the culprit, I hope they can capture it safely and relocate it without any issues. Hopefully this will be the last update. My roommate went ahead and put the wards near windows just to be safe. She's been more freaked out about it than I have been. On Sunday, December 16th, my wife and I were driving through a residential area in Chico, California. It was around 11 PM. We had been visiting a friend for the holidays. I'm not very familiar with the area but at the time we were on Volambrosa Avenue on the left there is a wooded park. We had just driven under the Golden State Highway overpass when suddenly a large dark man-like creature leapt out from the woods onto the road. I quickly stopped the car as my tires screeched on the roadway. This creature was massive and had dark hair all over its body. I don't know how wide the road is but it was across in three large leaps. As it reached the north side of the road it turned and looked directly at us. My wife was terrified and crouched down in her seat. I caught a brief golden colored reflection from its eyes. I hit the accelerator and quickly continued driving. I had driven about 100 yards or so, then noticed that either this creature was keeping pace with me or that I passed another similar creature on my left side crouched down by the road. I still think that this was another creature because it looked smaller in size than the creature I witnessed previously. By this time I was very concerned and scared. I was hoping that there would be no traffic lights until we reached the turn off to get onto the highway. I live about 80 mile north of Chico in an area where there have been a few Bigfoot reports but I have never heard of any in Chico, let alone in a residential location. I talked to my friend in Chico and he said that there was a sighting in his area back in the 1990s but nothing recent. Most of the sightings in his county, Butte County, 
have been in an area 30 miles southeast of Chico near Lake Oroville. I checked out the BFRO website and verified what my friend said. I know that we witnessed something that night and I think that there were more than one of these creatures roaming around. I would appreciate your thoughts. I grew up in a rural area of Calhoun County, West Virginia. The land we lived on had been in my father's family for many generations and was surrounded by hundreds of acres of woodlands. My sister and I were raised to respect our elders and not to question our parents. Our parents stressed attending and succeeding at school. My father was what you would call a handyman. There wasn't much that he couldn't do even though he hadn't received much schooling. My mother was a homebody and didn't care much about traveling about. My sister and I were warned about the dangers in the world, especially those dangers close to home. Both our parents used to talk about the snowman. This was a terrifying spirit that lived in a hidden burial mound for most of the year. It would rise from the mound after the first snowfall and roam the area each night until the last frost. The snowman was feared by the Mingo people who once lived here in the early 1700s. My father told us that there was a great massacre of Mingo people one night, not far from our home. The snowman gathered the bodies and carried them to his hidden mound. He described the snowman as a tall, rotund being with long white hair all over the body. But the most terrifying aspect was that the snowman had no face, just long white hair draped over from its head. We were warned not to venture out in the dark. The house was kept quiet during those winter nights because we didn't want to draw the attention of the snowman. In January 1979, my sister and I were both in our early teens. One evening around 8 p.m. we were in the kitchen doing homework at the table. Our father walked in from the living room and grabbed his coat by the door, then stepped out into the night. I asked my mother what he was doing and she told me that he had forgot to bring in the firewood for the night. No sooner had she responded to my question, my father rushed through the door. He grabbed one of the kitchen chairs and wedged it on the door. Then he opened the cellar door and retrieved his 12-gauge shotgun and a handful of pumpkin ball shells. What had he seen? He stood at the door and said snowman, he's out there. I ran upstairs to the attic so I could get a look out the window. My sister was right behind me. For almost 10 minutes, we noticed no movement. Then my sister said look at the garden. There it was. It was huge, maybe 8 feet high. It would stand, walk a few feet, then crouch down digging into the hard frozen ground. It continued do this for several minutes. Then it stood up and moved closer to the house. Father was correct, there were no facial features. A second or two later it turned and moved into the woods. I never saw it again. My mother is still with us and continues to live in the old house. She says that she is heard screaming at night, but believes it's the spirits of the Mingo people killed by the snowman. I sneaked out of the house after my mother went to sleep one night around midnight to meet up with some friends. I walked down the road in front of a country store, where I would be picked up by friends, in a small rural town of which I lived in. After an hour and no text back from my friends I realized they had ditched me. So I started to ascend into the darkness of the night and walked down a 45 miles per hour back road that lead to my home. After turning my back for a minute, I begin to see headlights casting behind me. I noticed they were driving really slow. Like 10 miles per hour right behind me. I was a small teenage girl, so I started running as fast as I could. I was only a 5 minutes walk away from my home when I saw the car pacing behind me slowly speeding up. The road is 45 miles per hour and the car was traveling about 15 or 14 miles per hour. When I was on the side of the road running, I lost my footing and fell into a deep road ditch. I closed my eyes, took a long breath, and screamed. The car slammed its brakes and then floored the gas pedal the second I screamed. My hand was covered in blood from the jagged rocks I landed on. Then I continued my walk and never talked about it. 
a year later I realized that there was a small neighborhood directly located across the street. I believe the car missed its opportunity. Be safe, and always tell someone where you are. At all times. My family and friends would have never seen me again. And I would have been less than a mile from my own home. Edit, chances are I wouldn't have been found due to the fact my parents at that time had called me in as a runaway several times. The police would much rather assume that your child isn't missing, and that they ran away instead. They won't investigate until it's far too late. And most evidence would be gone. This is common in many cold cases where police don't take families serious when their child is missing once they've been labeled as a runaway. I had a home life filled with domestic violence, verbal abuse, and other forms. I have run away to even avoid beatings. I believe parents should be investigated when children run away. A few months ago I was home alone at around 3 p.m., sitting in my living room watching TV. I hear a knock on my door and I go to my bedroom to look out the window. My bedroom window looks out to the front door, and I can see out but people outside can't see in. I'm looking around and I see a dude dressed in a suit, even though it's like 90 degrees outside, and he's backed up about 10 feet from my front door, huge smile on his face, just waving. He stands there and waves with that creepy smile on his face for 30 to 45 seconds, before walking away. He doesn't get in a car, just walks down the street to God knows where. This was a little off-putting to me and I was a little freaked out since I was alone, but I just go back to watching TV. Almost exactly 3 hours later, at 6 PM, he knocks on the door, backs up, and just waves. Then again, Three hours later at 9 p.m. he does the same. Every time I just ignored him, but I was debating either calling the police, or opening the door with my metal bat in hand and telling him to F off. I was wondering if he would come again at midnight, but he didn't, thank God. I don't know what this dude was up to but it was weird nonetheless. I was homesick from school in 8th grade and saw these two men in my backyard on our back patio. Our yard was fenced in and so I knew they had to have opened the fence to get in. I hid in a closet and called my dad to see if anyone was expected to be at the house. He said no and so I think then I slowly went to check what was going on. I peered into the kitchen and they were right up to the kitchen window oh my god so scary. Being that close up meant they had to go through some shrubs in front of the windows. So I hit again and called 911. Two cops arrived and accused me of basically a false alarm. More than that, they said we heard a male voice coming from inside while we were checking the backyard. I said it must be the TV but by all means come in and check for themselves. They were very rude and there I was terrified and had called them for help. Later in the day, I told my family what happened. My brother was pissed and called the police department to complain. Turned out that while the cops were leaving my street, they saw the two guys who fit my description. The two men were surveying the land in the neighborhood. The cops easily could have let me know. Mr. Jones between 2008 to 2011 I used to struggle with fairly frequent sleep paralysis. I often had auditory hallucinations of tree branches and leaves cracking and thrashing in the wind during these episodes. I sought a sleep clinic and they did assist me in reducing the frequency and severity of hallucinations or episodes. But I will never forget Mr. Jones. Throughout my time in university residence, through a few rooms and a townhouse, I always had a closet visible to me from my bed. Around early 2009, before I had sought sleep clinic assistance, my auditory hallucinations had grown to audiovisual, with a man emerging slowly from my closet. His hands, eyes, and chest sprouted large dead tree limbs that terminated in dozens of spindly branches. I could always hear him first before he emerged. He never did get close to me, and usually I was able to disengage from my hallucination around the same time each episode, but this tree being haunted me for years. Finally, 
After significant efforts of a therapist and a sleep clinic, I was able to halt the sleep paralysis. Q2013. A bad movie comes out. Mr. Jones. I'm up late, scrolling Netflix, and on a stark red and black background is that tree man. The movie poster was an almost picture-perfect version of Mr. Jones, a full two years after my sleep paralysis stopped. It's silly and obviously coincidental, but seeing that silhouette after the torment I felt and after so much time shook my foundations a bit. I haven't seen or heard Mr. Jones since but I still recall that terror. Home alone, terrified. This just happened happened and I'm still shaking. I'm terrified that whatever that was might come back. I can't stop shaking. My fingers are quivering as I peck this out on the keyboard. Everything in my head is telling me that it couldn't have happened, that I was seeing things or that as was a night terror. As much as I hate to admit, it had to be real. I know good and well that I am sane, but the fear I have borders on trepidation. I wanted to post this to Reddit and ask for help, if anyone knows what this might be or if anyone has a similar experience. What I saw. What happened. Please hear me out. Hear me out and believe that it is the truth, and that I am of sound mind. It stared when I was home alone, cliché I know, but hear me out. I was sitting on the couch in the den watching house, it was about 8, and my parents, brother, and two sisters had just left to get dinner roughly 30 minutes ago. I, being sick with the strep virus that has been going around, stayed home. Just me and my two dogs who were in my brother's room just down the hall. I had just let them out five minutes ago and put them in there. So I sat, couch locked with a bowl of hot soup in Dr. Gregory house. Everything was good. I'm sitting, watching, eating when there is a knock at the door. I really don't want to get up and answer the door, so I just sit there. Ignore it and it'll go away, right? I finish my soup and lay down. I figure I'll try to get some sleep. The minute I close my eyes there is another knock at the door. I ignore it again. I close my eyes resolved on counting sheep. Thud. Thud. Someone is pounding on my door. I lean up and look over the couch to see who the hell is beating down my door at this hour. No one. It is pitch black outside. I look over at the oven clock, 1047. I'm pretty freaked out. I sink low into the couch to make sure that, if there was someone out there, they couldn't see me. I watch the window on the door for a good long while, hoping to catch whoever was knocking. Not a sound, just dead silence. Maybe they saw that the TV on, and left? I close my eyes again thinking that they had just left, clearly no one was going to open the door for them. Thud. 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 Louder this time. I was torn from my sleep and throw into a state of panic. Someone was out there. Waiting. I turn off the TV making sure it was as dark inside as it was outside. I wait for my eyes to adjust and slip into the kitchen, crawling on my hands and knees. I can't see the front door from the kitchen so I hurry. I grab a knife from the drawer expecting the worst, expecting the door to give way to whoever was pounding on it. Thud 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 again louder. I clench the knife in my hand as tight as possible, preparing for a fight. I inch over to the corner and peer out. Nothing was there. I watch the door, still nothing out there. The porch light is on, but I still can see anything. I need to call the someone, but I left my phone in my room, which is to the immediate left of the front door. I walk down the hall, making sure I'm not visible from the front door. Finally I reach my brother's room. Maybe our dogs will scare them off, but the dogs aren't in there, the room is empty. I put the dogs in there, I know I did, where the hell are they? Where is my family? They left at 6.30 and now it is nearly 11. I close the door and quietly make my way back to the den. Thud. Thud. I heard the door handle shaking as the thudding continued louder than ever. I still have the knife but I question its use against whoever is out there. I hunker down behind the sofa, waiting for it to stop. I lean up to get a look at it but again nothing, 
The pounding stopped and it was silent. Nothing was outside. I get up, making sure that I don't break eye contact with the window for even a second. Making it past that door to my phone is my top priority. I walk carefully up to the door, hugging the wall so that I am not seen. I am 10 feet from my bedroom door. I step out form around the corner to see it there in the window staring at me. It slammed its face into the window cracking it, sending web-like fracture throughout the glass. It fogged up the window with its breath. Its eyes burned bright yellow and its face was unbelievably pale. Its mouth hung open crooked, full of jagged yellow teeth. Its mouth slowly turned upwards into a grin, but it sat there, making no noise with its face against the glass. I froze. I screamed in my head run. But I couldn't move. Its grin grew wider as it gazed at me, feeding off of my terror. It pressed its head into the window again, cracking it more. I closed my eyes tight, shaking my head, regaining control over my body. When I opened them again it was gone. I ran into my bedroom and slammed the door behind me. I ran into my room and set the knife on my desk next to my phone and ripped my phone off of its charger. I open up the contacts and hit the first number on the recent contact list. Thud. Thud. The door is shaking violently. The phone is ringing. My mom answers. What? She sounded tired where are you? I was yelling. I'm in the den? Where else would I be? It's 11.30. Quit yelling, she said quietly. I pulled my phone away from my ear to look at the screen. Hoping to figure something out. I thought you were out for dinner? I asked, my voice thin. We've been back since 8.20. She sounded exasperated. I hung up the phone and put it back on my desk. The knife was gone. No no no, this isn't right. I was on the couch. I think I would have known if they came home. I slowly opened my door to peer out at the front window. The cracks in the glass were gone. I stepped out into the entryway and looked outside. It's dark, but no movement whatsoever. I looked out into the den to see my mom sitting on the sofa watching celebrity news that she recorded. What the hell is happening? I didn't take any medication so I was sure as hell sober. I look at the glass, rubbing my head. This all happened, why is everything normal? Why isn't the glass broken? I walk down the hallway to my brother's room to talk to him, but he is fast asleep. The dogs come running out as soon as I open the door. The dogs weren't in there when I opened the door earlier. I pet them and let them out. I let the dogs back in and my mom turns to me. Why did you call me? I didn't know you were home. I replied. She frowned go to bed. I turned and walked back to my room, keeping a watchful eye on the front door. There is no way that I imagined this, it was all too real. There is no way that they were home, I was in the den the whole time. I pulled the covers up tight to my chest hoping it would bring me comfort. It didn't. I threw the covers off and began typing. I remembered that Reddit had a place for things like this, a place where people could share experience and seek advice. What was out there was as real as I am. The fear I am feeling is real too. What the hell was that thing? Why my house? Why me? Never in my life have I been paralyzed by fear before. Please believe me, please help me. I live in a two-bedroom apartment with my roommate. It's a pretty rundown building, with only 12 units and 3 floors, including the basement. The security is pretty much non-existent. Both the front and back doors to the building don't lock properly and to be honest, Anyone could probably break down the unit doors with just their body mass. That being said, the walls in this apartment are paper thin. You can hear anything and everything, which makes talking about anything personal a little off-putting. I'm someone who locks the door behind me immediately when I enter my apartment or my car. I am weary of people due to some trauma in my past. After living here for a few months, I felt pretty secure despite the lack of locks and such. My neighbors are all kind and normal from what I can tell. People generally keep to themselves and my floor is quieter than the others. 
I almost never see anyone in the hallways. One day, I was home alone and in the bathroom. The knob handle on the door of the bathroom does not have a lock, on either the outside or the inside. When I went to open the door to get out of the bathroom the knob wouldn't turn. I immediately started panicking and thinking of the worst possible reasons for why the door wasn't turning. It was as if the whole knob was frozen, it wouldn't even jiggle the way that a normal locked door would. I regrettably didn't have my phone with me so couldn't even call my roommate to come help. I stopped trying to open the door and after about 2-3 to three minutes of pacing in my very small bathroom I tried again and the door opened normally. Some time had passed and nothing else strange happened until a few months later. I was home alone again and used the bathroom. This time, I was showering and expecting my partner to come over at some point. When I was out of the shower drying off, I heard footsteps passing by outside the door and a bedroom door open, either mine or my roommates, they are next to each other right outside the bathroom. I figured it was my partner so I continued to take my time. When I reached for the handle it was frozen again and I was locked inside the bathroom. I started pounding on the door hoping whoever was there, my partner or my roommate, would hear and come help. When the door locks it's almost as if there's pressure being put on the other side of the handle. At this point, I'm nervous that whoever I heard is not someone I know. I pounded so hard on the door it dented it, to give you an idea of how fragile they are. After some aggressive pounding the door finally opened. Of course there was no one I could see in the apartment. My partner wasn't there nor was my roommate. I immediately called my roommate to ask if they had come into the apartment to grab something, hoping that I was just ultra paranoid. They told me they hadn't and I explained the situation. They gave me permission to search their room. I did so very nervously. I checked every closet and under the beds and the couch to make sure there was no one hiding. I don't really know what I would have done if I found someone but I knew I had to check or I wouldn't feel safe. A few more months have passed and nothing has happened to either my roommate or myself. She has never experienced the door locking, and I have only experienced it happening while no one was home. This past weekend my family came and picked me up for a wedding. When they dropped me off in the evening they came inside to use the bathroom and check out my apartment, they don't live nearby. My dad was examining things the way dads do and he was looking at the bathroom door quizzically. I decided to tell them the weird story of being locked in there a few times, nonchalantly. I wasn't as shaken up about it anymore and since so much time had passed I just assumed that it must just be the latch on the door. My dad, who is pretty paranoid himself, didn't like those stories and examined the latch and knob himself. He said they looked fine to him and must have just stuck from heat or something. Get this, that very same night I was locked in the bathroom again. It felt like an eerie coincidence to me, given that I had just spoken out loud about the occurrence and I'm always worried about what people might hear outside the apartment. I told my roommate about the occurrence last night. We talked about what could possibly have caused it, theorizing what or who it could be. I even noted that I felt uneasy talking about it out loud and she agreed. That night, I woke up to really loud pacing in the hallway outside our unit door at around midnight. I went out to make sure our doors were locked they were. The pacing continued for over an hour. Unfortunately my unit does not have a peephole, so I can't safely look at what's going on. Could be entirely unrelated but it's certainly abnormal behavior for the folks in this building to be lurking the halls late at night. What do you think? Should I be more concerned or am I being ultra paranoid? I was serving as a private first class in the Marine Corps in Vietnam in the summer of 1969. My two buddies and I were sitting on top of a bunker near Da Nang on a warm summer evening. All of a sudden, I don't know why, we all three looked out there in the sky and saw this figure coming toward us. It had a kind of glow, and we couldn't make out what it was at first. It started coming toward us, real slowly. All of a sudden, we saw what looked like wings, like a bat's, only it was gigantic compared to what a regular bat would be. After it got close enough for us to see what it was, 
It looked like a woman. A naked woman. She was black. Her skin was black, her body was black, the wings were black, everything was black. But it glowed. It glowed in the night, kind of a greenish cast to it. There was a glow on her and around her. Everything glowed. It looked like she glowed and threw off a radiance. We saw her arms toward the wings, and they looked like regular molded arms, each with a hand, fingers, and everything, but they had skin from the wings going over them. And when she flapped her wings, there was no noise at first. It looked like her arms didn't have any bones in them because they were limber just like a bat's. She started going over us, and we still didn't hear anything. She was right above us, and when she got over the top of our heads, she was maybe six or seven feet up. We couldn't do anything. We didn't know what to do. We just froze. We just watched what was going over because we couldn't believe our eyes. We watched her go straight over the top of us, and still, she didn't make any noise flapping her wings. She blotted out the moon once, that's how close she was to us. As we watched her, she got about 10 feet or so away from us, and we started hearing her wings flap. It sounded like regular wings flapping. She just started flying off, and we watched her for quite a while. The total time from when we first saw her and could almost define her until we lost sight of her and were unable to define her was between 3 and 4 minutes. Two years ago, I went to a wilderness area in southwest Idaho called Big Jack's Creek. The first time I visited was with my roommate and his dog. It was fun, we saw a deer carcass, which indicated predators lived there, and we came across what looked like an old den. Fast forward a couple of months, and I decided to go alone. I felt like I needed a solo adventure, and it was only a two-hour drive. When I got there, I loaded my backpack with snacks, water, and my 9 meters M. That's when things started to get weird. I felt like I was being watched the entire time. Any sound made me jump, and any small movement made me whip my head around. It didn't feel like an animal, it felt more like a spirit or something paranormal was watching me. I reached my intended spot, took a rest, drank some water, and then walked maybe a mile back to my car, with my gun in my hand. In the distance, I saw a very old, destroyed house that seemed to be from the 1800s. I had the unsettling feeling that whatever, if anything, was watching me was doing so from that house. It seemed to be moving so fast that it was watching me from very close. I got to my car and drove home, and I haven't gone back alone since. Well, I have written about and reported a few fairy-like being encounters over the years, including a leprechaun or two. There are also legends of the Tommenachers in mining areas worked by Irish immigrants throughout North America. After I received the inquiry I looked back through my files, including a few journals I had kept from the 1970s. I did manage to find an odd anecdote that was told to me by a friend of a friend in 1976 while in Philadelphia. From what I gathered an ancestor by the name of Finn, who lived in Colonel Philadelphia, had a bit of trouble keeping port wine on hand. It seemed that each morning he noticed that the level of a barrel he kept in the cellar got lower. In fact, it had gotten to a point where he thought his wife was taking a dipper full each night while he slept. Though he had never known her to have a taste for the stuff. One day while working at the dock he asked his friend Donal what he thought about the situation. Donal looked back at Finn and laughed. His nibs is sampling your stock. Finn had no idea what Donal was referring to. His nibs. A cluricon is stealing your spirits. Honestly, when I heard the story I had no idea what a cluricon was. Apparently, it is an Irish fairy that resembles the leprechaun. Some describe the cluricon as a knight form of the leprechaun, who goes out to drink after finishing his daily chores. Cluricons are said to favor drunkenness more than not. However, Unlike their cousins, they are surly. If you treat them well they will protect your wine cellar, however, if mistreated, they will wreak havoc on a home and spoil the wine stock. 
Occasionally he can be heard singing Irish folk songs in the wine cellars. The Cluricon is great to have around the house because he also protects your home from vandals and thieves. They are also referred to as club hairs and as nibs. According to Donal, if Finn wanted to see the Cluricon and leave a cup of wine on the nightstand, it can't resist an offer of a drink. Donal warned, don't scare it away. There will be dire consequences if you do. That night, Finn left a full cup of wine on his nightstand hoping to catch a glimpse of the imp. A little bit after midnight Finn heard the floorboards creaking. As he slowly opened his eyes, he gazed upon a small three feet man wearing a red hat made of plant leaves and a red wool vest. It resembled leprechauns and all its physical characteristics. As he watched the Cluricon reach for the cup a horrific scream shot from behind him. His wife also caught a glimpse of the small being and reacted instinctively. The Cluricon dropped the cup on the floor and dashed out of the room. Flynn thought, what now? Flynn tried to lure the Cluricon back into its good graces with several offers of wine but was never successful. It is said that Flynn could never keep fresh wine again. It always turned to vinegar as soon as it was brought into the house. Had a nasty encounter with what I can only assume was either a demon or a very angry ghost during the summer of 2019. It was the end of a summer camp for people who aren't ready for college. Literally the last night, located in the Berkshires on a college campus. We took a trip to Boston for some reason and someone thought it was a good idea to buy a Ouija board. I've seen one too many YouTube videos to know where this was going. I'm not much of a believer in God or Christianity, I'm an atheist, but there was this one girl who claimed to be on a first name basis with Saint Michael, and she blessed the board to prevent bad things from happening. I went upstairs and tried to go to bed but I had this feeling that something bad was gonna happen so I went downstairs. Not to knock Saint Michael or anything, if he exists, but that blessing apparently only affected those who were playing, and they had successfully contacted a spirit, claiming that two campers would be cursed to die in the near futures and casually name drops one of them. We go check on him and the stench of sulfur and rotten eggs is evident. Hysterical, we get one of the staffers to check on him. Turns out he was dangerously close to attempting act of unaliving himself that night. And that was the night when we learned not to screw with the paranormal, because the paranormal can take it and dish it right back and why when I got home I actively feared the Ouija board we owned. Eventually mom broke it over her knee and threw it away. I've had a few unexplained things or major coincidences happen in my life but the last few months I've had a couple which have properly stumped me. My fiancé and I moved into our house in a small village in the north of Scotland in December 2020. The main layout is on the ground floor while the loft space is split. Half is converted and half has the water tank, etc. And is only accessible via a small hatch in the converted section. I went up there when we moved in just to see what was in there and it's just some random bits left by the previous owners but other than that, nothing out the ordinary. Fast forward to November 2021 and Storm Arwen hit us, for those outside of the UK as was a bad wind storm, winds up to 120 miles per hour or so. We lost power and water for a week and had some damage. Part of the property damage sustained was three big areas of roof slates on one end of the house above the uncovered loft area, which is above the living room. We're sat in the living room the day after the storm and calling insurance etc. All of a sudden we start hearing dripping in the ceiling at the end of the room where the damage is. I go up to investigate and all of the insulation under the damaged area has been lifted and perfectly placed to the side, leaving the wood underneath exposed. The rain was dripping through from the spots where tiles had lifted so I went and got bowls and towels to stop it from getting through the ceiling or down the inside of the wall. When I was going back and forth I noticed that the insulation was wet with no dripping above. I hadn't been in there for nearly a year and there was never any disturbance to the insulation. 
creeped me the F out, but the only thing I can say is I guess someone wanted to warn us before there was any more damage to the house. In high school, we would often cut class and hang out at a friend's house who had been expelled for fighting. One day, while playing pool in his basement, I was standing a few feet away from the staircase. There was no one else in the house except for the six of us in the basement. Suddenly, we heard a ball start bouncing down the stairs. We quickly hid, thinking it might be his parents who had come home early and accidentally kicked the ball down the stairs. I hid behind an old pantry wall with a big crack in it that gave me a clear view of the stairs. I stared at the stairs as the sound of the ball got closer and closer, but the ball never appeared. After a few minutes, we all came out of hiding and looked for the ball upstairs, but it was nowhere to be found. A few weeks later, we were cutting class again. This time, the house was full. Some of us were on the second floor playing video games. Others were in the living room on the first floor watching his dad's soft corn videos, and a few were playing pool in the basement. I was in the living room when we suddenly heard an extremely loud bang upstairs that made the house shake. As we all ran to see what happened, all three groups met at the staircase, each asking what was going on. It turned out that nothing had happened, and to this day, we never found out what caused the loud bang. Sometime later, when I wasn't at the house but others were, a story was told to me. A friend, who was a gang member, had left a shotgun at our friend's house for safekeeping. One of the kids at the house found it under my friend's mattress. He came downstairs, racked the shotgun, pointed it at another friend's head, and pulled the trigger while reciting a line from some gangster and mafia movie. Our friend who was storing the gun yelled at him for playing with it, but before he could grab it, the kid with the gun pointed it at the old school TV console and pulled the trigger, shooting a slug right through it while also reciting a line. My friend who was storing the gun was very familiar with firearms and had ensured that the gun was unloaded. In fact, he had checked it himself because he had siblings and didn't want any accidents. That was basically the end of cutting class at GSOTA. We spent our time playing pool, making movies and skits, wrestling, playing video games, cooking, and watching movies. Kids from three high schools would stop by and hang out daily. Those were great times and memories. I went camping alone in the Lake District, Cumbria, a few years ago. I was on my own and had basically walked from Windermere to Troutbeck, about 8 to 9 miles, in the summer heat with a heavy rucksack. I ended up camping at Brothers Water Campsite and was one of the only few people at the camp. I ate some food and went to sleep in my tent, tired from a good day's walk. At some point during the night, I awoke to the sound of thud thud thud, the sound of heavy boots approaching my tent, similar to the vibration you feel when someone walks towards you on the soft grass and rocks. My brain didn't really have time to process it, but it felt odd that someone was making a beeline directly towards my tent in the middle of the night. Then I heard multiple voices sort of chanting in a low voice, getting closer and louder. By this point, I was more confused than scared but admittedly on edge. The boots got closer and increased the pace. Someone or some people were running towards my tent, making strange noises, and then my tent started unzipping. My confusion turned to the cold fear you get of the unknown, and I did the only thing I could think of, considering I was trapped in a sleeping bag in a small tent. I kicked out with both my feet, swinging my body weight in the general direction of the opening, knowing full well that it would connect with whoever was opening my tent. Instead, my feet flopped against the side of the tent, connecting with only the fabric. I startled myself awake. I was having a night terror brought on by a combination of sunstroke and exhaustion. It was all in my head. A very lucid hallucination. It scared me too.
My neighborhood is in rural Georgia and is mostly surrounded by woods. Each house's yard has a metal fence and a metal gate before the driveway that require a button to be pushed remotely for it to open automatically. I was in high school at the time and always did my homework in the kitchen at night. To prevent my parents from seeing what was on my screen if they walked in, I strategically sat myself with my laptop away from view at the table in a position where my back was about a yard or two away from the glass side door to my house. It was about 2 am and I was alone, the only one awake in the house. I was working on an essay when, literally a few feet behind me, I heard a series of rapid, loud, slams against the door, as if someone or something very large was trying to get in. I hear the glass crack. As soon as I heard that sound, my skin crawled, my heart dropped, and I was in fight or flight mode. Something with a large force was mere feet behind me, with only a sheet of glass separating us. My life was in immediate danger. I instantly realized how stupid I was to place myself in such a position and it felt like a century before I could turn around. My imagination was running wild. I whip my head around with enough speed to give me whiplash and witness a gigantic stag thrusting his antlers and pressing his face against the glass. Our eyes locked. The light from my kitchen reflecting off of them made him look demonic. I have never seen a deer of this mass and this close. In fact, as a Brooklyn transplant, I haven't seen a deer in person at this point. To be perfectly honest, I didn't recognize it as a deer at first. My high school brain, pumping with adrenaline and Adderall, didn't even know how to perceive this thing. It had wide eyes, and I could see the glass fogging from his breathing. I am out of my chair at this point, and he takes off. I run to wake up my family, letting them know what happened. We walk out the side door to see the porch covered in splotches of blood. My beagles are going wild with the smells. Oh the smells. I've never smelled anything like it in my life. Like something alive, of course, something of nature, but something very foreign to me. The stag was long gone. Me and some friends went camping in the woods near a river at 16. I had a great time getting really high for the first time. And we got into the tent to go to sleep at about 1 am. You always hear sounds outside a tent, but you know to just ignore them. But they started to get more and more distinct. My friend was sketching out, and I told him it was just someone walking their dog. I knew exactly what was going to happen when I heard them running towards the tent, and then the sound stopped. Man jumped on the tent. I got out and couldn't see anything. I searched the woods and eventually saw the two guys hiding upstream. We chased them up and found their campsite about a mile upstream. Our mistake was showing ourselves in the light. It became quickly apparent that they were much bigger and older than them. Anyway, we went back and waited, knowing they'd probably return. I heard sounds by the river, so I looped around and walked up behind them, crouching behind a log, and casually said hello. The bigger of the two guys was holding a hammer and leaned towards me with a smile, like the rabbit in Donnie Darko. For some reason, I wasn't really scared and just had a normal conversation. The night continued with us basically sitting by the fire with these two men waiting just out of sight until 5 am when it got light. They walked up and tried to intimidate us with the hammock. I recently went camping in a dense campground with my fiancé. At around 3 a.m. on one of the nights, we heard something messing with a tarp we had laying on the ground right outside of our tent. I was walking back and forth on it for a few minutes. It scared the absolute hell out of me, but logically I knew it could only be a raccoon or something of a similar size, or a creeper idiot person trying to scare us. We didn't open our door until we heard it walk away. The neighbors were already up and getting ready to go watch the sunrise somewhere, and they said they hadn't seen or heard anything, so it was definitely not anything too big. But an actual danger happened to me as a kid. I was camping in the woods with my dad and brother, my dad's friend, and his two kids. It was nighttime, 
and me and one of the other kids were chilling out in our tent looking at CDs with the front door flap open so we could also admire the fire. My dad was sitting next to the fire. We heard some kind of creaking sound, and my dad started screaming, get out of the tent. We dropped everything and ran out, just as the creaking turned into a loud snap. An old dead branch fell out of the tree near our tent and right onto where we had been sitting. There was a foot-long gash in the tent fabric, which we fixed with duct tape, and the CD case we had been looking at was cracked. We were very lucky to have been able to get out of the way fast enough. One time I went camping with my parents, brother, and almost the entire side of my mom's family, around 30 people, so we were a big group. This was somewhere in Merced, California, and we were there for, I think, four days. My cousin was the one always booking the areas, so he booked this one because there was a small lake for the kids to swim in and it was a nice spot. We were right by the parking lot and there was a store and bathrooms nearby, so it was great. He failed to mention, however, that we were in front of a cemetery. Everything was fine until the second night. It was getting dark and we were getting things ready to make a fire when my cousin's son, around four, started running off towards the parking lot. My dad sees him and sees no adult watching him, so he goes after him. My dad asks him why he's running away, and he says he's trying to catch the ball. So my dad starts looking for a ball and finds nothing and keeps asking the kid to point out the ball because he can't see it. He then tells my dad the ball moved and he goes after it. This is when my dad freaks out because this kid is clearly chasing an invisible ball. My dad grabs the kid and takes him back to the house, but says nothing because he thinks it's probably the kid being a kid. The next night, the same thing but this time towards the direction of the lake, and the same story. This time he says there's a boy who keeps kicking it that way. My dad tells my cousin and she asks him about it, but he suddenly refuses to talk and acts like nothing happened. They forget about it until the next day, when as soon as it gets dark, this kid starts screaming and hiding his face against his mom. She asks him what's wrong, and he keeps pointing to something and screaming. The kid wouldn't stop hiding, and every time he looked up, he kept screaming and crying. The kid was terrified for some reason, and he did not get out of the tent for the rest of the night. We had no idea what he saw, but other things happened to other members of the group, and we decided to leave the next morning. I was 19 and out in the woods in the Mount Hood wilderness in Oregon. My girlfriend and I drove out 15 miles into no man's land and then hiked another 6 miles to the spot we had decided on. It was the very beginning of spring at around 5,000 feet and there was still snow on the ground. The forest road we took was littered with downed trees from the previous storm. On the trail, which was covered in snow, we followed what looked to me like fresh black bear tracks, didn't mention this to the lady. We got to our destination set up camp, and popped a few tabs. It eventually became dark, and freezing, so we took shelter in our tent. We were still tripping at this point but were trying just to rest. I had packed the food away from our camp to be safe, but as we lay awake in our tent, we began to hear a rustling. I immediately think of a bear. We just lay there, paralyzed in fear, listening to every sound the woods had to offer, thinking it was moving closer. This went on for probably an hour, it's hard to say because, but eventually the fear passed and we began to drift off. My girlfriend had fallen asleep, and I was on the verge of drifting off but still had some residual effects from the LSD. All of a sudden, I saw a blinding light pass over our tent, which seemed to light up everything. My first thought was that I was being abducted by an alien or something. We were way out in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night. This time I had enough courage to peek outside my tent, only to see four hikers with headlamps passing by at close to midnight. A very strange night indeed. And it scared the crap out of me. In the morning, we checked out our food sack and realized it had just been a rodent that got into it.
When I was seven, my family joined my aunt and cousins on a church retreat slash camping road trip for two weeks. The first week was tame. We stayed at a cabin retreat with family activities. The second week, we began on a road trip through California to camp. On the first day, we stopped at one of those ghost towns. My cousin dared me to steal a rock, and as legend has it, something bad would happen to me for taking haunted property. I expected something like a broken bone or just something painful. That night, we were driving to a campsite down a long, dark, winding road. I was in my aunt's minivan, and my family was following behind. At some point, my aunt says she no longer sees my family in the rear view, but not to worry because it's only one road into a single campsite. They couldn't possibly miss us if they just continued. My aunt had packed all the camping gear, so me and my cousin set up all of my family's tents while waiting for them. Hours later, and still no sign of their headlights. Eventually, I just went to sleep and said we'd look for them on the drive out. We didn't see them. So my aunt just continued on the road trip, probably assuming they had car trouble and drove back to town. Cell phones weren't common, so there was no way of knowing and I was certain something happened because I stole that rock. That night, I stayed up listening to the sounds of life. Either a car crash or, hey, we're being hunted. I wasn't sure, but every sound was terrifying. Maybe they were being attacked by bears or mountain lions. My seven-year-old mind just couldn't think of anything harmless happening. Only terror. Six days later, we were finally on our way home. About two hours from home, my aunt falls asleep at the wheel and crashes into another sleeping driver. Both cars are totaled and we tried to call my dad at home to see if he could help, but still no answer. I'm still worried about them, and I was certain they were kidnapped by a serial killer or crashed off a mountain somewhere. After getting a rental, we finally made it home. It was two more days until we heard from them. Assholes got car sick driving down the dirt road into the campsite, so they turned back to stay at a hotel for the night. And to still enjoy their vacation, they stopped at bed and breakfast along the way and finished the week with two nights at Disneyland. They never thought to get a hold of anyone, and I lived with the guilt of having killed them for eight days, all because of that stupid rock. I didn't camp again for 13 years because it was just too stressful to think of people missing and not being able to find them. It turns out my family is just a bunch of dicks. I do most of my trekking in the Northeast US. I have seen a few black bears, moose and whatnot. Aside from a momentary panic, they all stuck to the wilderness bro code of don't F with me and I won't F with you. Anyway, one pitch black night in the white mountains of NH, I am sacked out in my tent, not a thought in my head after a nice day of mountain air. I hear something a few yards from my camp. No biggie, there are lots of creatures sharing the woods. I assure myself that I will set up my bear bag and go back to blissful mindlessness. I poke my head out and swing my headlamp around, secretly hoping I don't see anything. Um. Big. Nothing. More sound. This time I am focusing on locating it and looking out again. Something in the brush to my left. Damn, I have seen a hungry raccoon make a racket for hours if he thinks food is in the mix. I'd better show him I mean business. With my only armor being boxer briefs and a t-shirt, I slip on my boots and walk over to slay the dragon, er. Scare off Mr. Raccoon. I approach my query confident that my quest against the noisy trash panda will result in my victory and provide tales of my epic battle against a man-eater upon my return. Keep in mind, when in the wilderness, one must always be mindful that you are at a disadvantage and should prepare for the worst while hoping for the best, but I have little trepidation. I push back some branches and focus my light on the biggest white bunny rabbit I have ever seen. It was at this time that my spidey sense should have alerted me to the fact that rabbits in the wilds of NH are usually grey or brownish in color, never white. 
My spidey sense was apparently left in the tent because by the time the thought had a chance to bubble up in my brain, the little critter turned his head towards me and caught me in his demonic gaze with his bright, glowing red eyes. He hissed with the call of his godless people, as if he was cursing a pox upon me and all my bloodline. And like the brave vanquisher I am, I froze. You see, I had stuck my ugly mug right into the maw of a fat, angry, albino, skunk. Three days later, when my trip ended and I was picked up at the rendezvous point, I thought I had washed pretty well and really couldn't smell myself anymore. My buddy, he of the sensitive olfactory, felt otherwise, and I had to ride home in the back of his truck. Fat, smelly, and freezing is no way to end a camping trip. A bull moose stomps around our high mountain campsite at night. Up to 20 feet tall and covered in rocky scree and talos. A mountain lake, a cliff above, and trees slash scree fields were our four sides. Indian Peaks, Colorado, and Red Deer Lake, if anyone is familiar. As he angrily moved, you could feel the percussion of his feet through the ground. I feel it. So disarming. He was literally pushing trees over as he moved. Hear the trunks crack and fall. He was constantly kicking large rocks loose as he moved, sending them scattering loudly down the hill, shattering and thumping. His breathing eventually, I had to get out of the tent to see. It felt like he was on top of us. I could hear his breathing as if he were right there. I found he was never closer than 50 yards, but his sheer size made it seem so. What's more, he hung around for so long. The first event was clocked at over 10 minutes of him in our neighborhood, with another 10 minutes of him in earshot moving away. Just as sleep took me, an hour later, he returned. Repeating the performance my two dogs, who normally bark at anything and never show fear, even from a black bear encounter years prior, lay in the tent perfectly silent, shaking so hard you'd think it would kill them simply staring at me. I really thought the more timid one would die of fear. Hell, I was truly scared myself. Just a few weeks ago, we were on a road trip from British Columbia to San Diego, and we came upon a campsite just outside of Crescent City, California. We drove through, one side of the campground was relatively empty, and I noticed a few scattered tents but nobody close to the location we ended up picking. We had tons of space. We wanted an early night, so I started a fire while my girlfriend started cooking. We ate, had a few beers, and climbed up to our rooftop tent, teepee, with our dog by 9 p.m. or so. I had a rough time sleeping and woke up a few times, but finally fell into a decent sleep. In the pitch dark, with all of our tent windows and canvases closed, I was awoken at 1 a.m. by someone whistling outside of our tent to the tune of when the saints come marching in. After a few minutes of this repetitive whistling, I nudged my girlfriend, who awoke and was obviously freaked out as well. The whistling then turned to chanting things like when you sleep here you disrespect me, and when you disrespect me you disrespect the U.S. Marines. The person would then start spelling out words like F, L, E, E. The verbiage and tone kept getting more aggressive, so we decided we had to make a move. I slowly unzipped the tent while our guard dog was snoring and got my head out of the tent. I took a few seconds to let my eyes adjust and figure out where the person was. I felt more confident once I could somewhat see and hear, so I climbed down and the girlfriend passed me the dog, and she climbed down, too. We flipped the tent up without securing it, and we jumped into a truck, while the person was still whistling, to a motel in Crescent City. The next morning, we drove back to get the few belongings that weren't in the truck and a family who had been camping a few sites over said it went on for another three hours and it was the scariest thing their family had ever experienced. There was a small group of the oldest boys from my scout troop backpacking in North Carolina, probably eight boys and four adults. We had been hiking all day, 
probably covering 8 miles and gaining 6,000 feet in elevation. We found a grassy area just off the trail and set up camp. We were each cooking our own dinner, and it was getting dark when we heard someone running from down the trail. This dude, late 20s, was carrying a staff, dressed in black clothing, not carrying any water or pack, and running full tilt up the trail in the near dark. He didn't acknowledge us at all, just kept running. Nobody said anything as he passed, and we were just recovering from the surprise when it happened again. Up the trail comes a different guy, carrying a staff and nothing else, black clothes and all, running full tilt. We're getting confused and concerned at this point when it happens again. And again. And again. A total of six guys, all dressed the same and each carrying a staff, bolted up the trail at what seemed like perfect 60 second intervals. The last guy had a dog running right beside him, but other than that, they were all identical. There was no other place to camp nearby. There was no access to a road for at least 8 miles. We recovered from the shock, ate dinner, and were getting ready to sleep about an hour later. It's fully dark by this point. We hear him running again. Yup. The first guy runs past, no light, no hesitation. All six, and the dog, sprint past one after the other. We speculated about illegal activity, cult stuff, or dark rituals going on, and all slept uneasily. In the morning, we saw our footprints on the muddy trail from the previous day, but no boot prints from the runners or their dog. What I mean is, the trail past where we had hiked had no footprints at all. It had rained the day before, but not overnight. There was no reason for them to not have left tracks. We still speculate, seven years later, as to what could have been going on. This was a few years ago. I was on a 14-day canoe trip through a portion of the Canadian wilderness. As we paddled, I turned a corner to see one of the others jump out of her canoe onto land. As I got closer, I saw this weird, run-down looking campsite. At first I was excited because, hey, we were going to explore this run-down camp. But then something just felt off? I liked that feeling that you're being watched but I brushed it off as just being creeped out by the environment. So we started to look around. There was a burned down looking cabin up a hill, and these weird ropes or wires tied from tree to tree, and just junk laying around everywhere. I'd think it was pretty normal for a weird abandoned cabin in the middle of the wilderness. But then we started to notice things. We found some shirts hanging up in the cabin, in perfect condition despite the absolutely destroyed house. And then we found a toothbrush outside, near the dock we landed on, also in perfect condition. A few fishing poles sat upright outside, even though they would have very likely been blown down in a storm we'd had recently or at least they would have been if they weren't placed that way recently. And on a stump, a pair of children's shoes were just placed there, in pristine condition. All of these things had managed to survive the elements perfectly, unless someone had been by very recently to place them in this way. It all felt very deliberate. Nothing should have been how it was, especially that close to the water's edge. Like I said, the wind would have very easily moved it, especially the toothbrush and the fishing poles. Typing this, it sounds very mild, I guess, but we were all terrified. One of the others was scared. And finally we left, though I had to keep looking over my shoulder as we paddled across the lake. It just felt like someone was watching us, up until we rounded a corner and couldn't be seen anymore. The one who jumped out of the boat to begin with also wanted to take one of the fishing poles because ours was broken, and I talked her out of it. I felt like we were going to be cursed or hunted down if we took anything from the campsite. In the end, the only thing we took with us was pictures of one of the other campers posing with a moose leg that was lying on the dock. We camped on that lake that night. I slept with my knife under my sleeping bag, just in case, because the creepy feeling was there up until we moved on to the next lake.
The closest I ever came to death was a few years ago while camping. It's a long story, so stick with me. My wife and I aren't avid campers or anything, but we're on a road trip and wanted to save money, so we picked up a tent and some basic gear and left Boston headed west. We stopped at a campground west of Pittsburgh and set up shop. We're both really into stargazing and we're excited to finally get a chance to see some good stuff, being that far in the middle of nowhere, but unfortunately, it was cloudy and overcast the whole night and we didn't see squat. About 2 AM the first night we were there, I got up and had to pee, and about halfway to the public bathroom, I got lazy and just peed on the nearest tree. When I was done, I noticed the tree looked kind of scratched up but didn't think anything of it at the time. I walked back to the tent, and as soon as I lay down, a bolt of lightning and a clap of thunder woke my wife up, who is deathly afraid of lightning. So now we're both up and I'm trying to convince her that we're safe in the tent and won't get struck by lightning. Just then, we hear the most ferocious, loud, aggressive roar I have ever heard in my life just outside our tent. It was at this point that I realized that the scratched up tree sorta of reminded me of our cat scratch post and we were right in the middle of mountain lion country. Then I realized I was armed with only my stupid 4 inch bear grill switch blade knife I got at target and the only thing between me and that mountain lion was a thin polyester tent. So with my wife freaking out about the lightning and the mountain lion and me only freaking out about the lion, I decide the only way we're surviving this night is if we book it for the car and sleep there. I slowly open the tent, don't see any lions, and we beeline to the car safely. At this point, the thunder and lightning are starting to pick up and my wife is still freaking out, so we decide to look up the nearest hotel on my phone and just drive there. Luckily, we found one like 10 miles away, but being as though this is mountainous farm country, the GPS said it would take us at least a half hour. Now we're driving through country back roads, in a lightning storm with bolts hitting in open fields just yards away from the road, up and down mega hills, literally dodging fallen branches at 3 AM as the rain really picks up. We got to the hotel around 4 AM and got a good sleep for a few hours after we calmed down and before checkout time. When we got back to the campsite the next day, we realized the tree about 5 feet away from our tent was also scratched up, so evidently we were sleeping in the middle of this cat's living room. Okay, I'll have to set some stuff up. Our campsite had a wide lake with mountains surrounding us on all sides, so to get to it you had to creep downhill with your foot on the brake and go about an inch at a time. The drive alone was pretty scary, to be honest, but at that point I'd done it a hundred times. So I'm about 17. I recently discovered the beauty of alcohol and weed and what happens when you mix them. It's me and three of my friends, all staying at this campsite for four days. On the third day, we realized way too late that we were out of firewood, and three of us were already pretty messed up, so it was up to the youngest to head back into town to get more. They ended up taking forever, so we were three crossfaded college freshmen stuck in the woods alone, fully submerged in pitch blackness. In moments like this, you stare at the sky, and I saw something weird. I didn't want to say anything at first because I was new to this lifestyle of being far from sober. I didn't know what freaky results it could produce, but then my friend spoke up about the exact same thing I was fixated on. There's a light up there doing figure eights. It was super slow. I wasn't even certain it was moving at first, but sure enough, we all agreed it was steadily going in figure eights. This was before drones had been invented, it was too high up to be a plane or helicopter, and we were the only ones renting a campsite that week. We were completely alone out there. So we start speculating about what the light is. One person throws out terrorists. I say aliens, because I grew up on X-Files, and it's always aliens. We started speculating their intentions. They're going to drop a bomb on us. They're here to colonize the Earth. I say they're going to gas us and abduct us. As the words leave my mouth, what looks like a thick white mist comes rolling over the hill across the lake. 
All three of us screamed like tiny children. We fully believed the aliens were coming to gas us. I've never been scared like that before, so when my face went hot I thought it was due to an explosion of some sort. We get up, we turn to hide in the tent, and there's our friend coming down the hill in my car. The headlights are bouncing off the lake and projecting onto the mountains. No mist, no aliens, just a trick of the light, and a pair of urine-soaked undies. Not a very satisfying conclusion, but I still can't explain the light. One of the group said it was a laser pointer, but I felt like it was too steady for that. It was still there after we screamed, but it stopped moving completely. I know the woods are spooky, but I never thought the prairie could be as well. I was wilderness camping with my girlfriend in Grasslands National Park, Saskatchewan, a place known for its complete lack of trees while also being near the highest elevation point between the Rockies and Laurentian Mountains. A storm system moved in fairly quickly after we had already set up camp and settled in for the evening. There's absolutely no protection from rain, and nothing else around to deflect lightning strikes. We decided at the last minute that we should take our chances in GTFO, so we tore down our camp as quickly as possible and tried to hike out. We could see bolts striking ground no more than 5 kilometers away from us in every direction, and the last 15 minutes of sunset cast a deep red-orange hue over the entire landscape. The flashes and sound of crackling thunder as we were making our way up to the top of a bald coulee sent me absolutely trembling. It felt like we were escaping the apocalypse. Everything kinda looks the same there too, so this fear that we might be lost in the wrong direction was also terrifying. But man, was it memorable. I was camping out in the Boundary Waters canoe area with some friends. There were enough of us on the trip that we had two tents. Anyway, late one night, we are talking to the guys in the other tent, from our tent, and one of them says, what are you guys doing out of the tent? To which we respond, we are all in our tent. At this point, we all go quiet and listen because there is something walking slowly between our tents, you can hear the breathing and footsteps on the ground. At this point, we slowly start to unzip the windows to look into the darkness, and there is something quite large standing there, but we still can't quite make it out. Then one of my tent mates flips on his flashlight, and we are only 10 feet away from a massive black bear standing between the tents, who was quite curious about our camping situation. We did have an air horn, so we just gave a short toot and the bear ran off into the night. Looking back, it wasn't that scary, but at the time it was quite frightening. When I was in Scouts, we took a trip to Algonquin National Park. They have these super intense and super small storms hurricane force over a mile or two area if that. I was sleeping at night and woke up to thunder and lightning. I'm in this flimsy little tent and the rain is pouring like crazy. Anyway, after the initial shock of the lightning that woke me up, I tried going back to sleep. After a few minutes, lightning struck nearby. I don't mean within a half mile, I mean within yards of my tent. It was so loud, and I was sure I heard an explosion. I was wide awake for another hour or more before the storm passed and I could finally sleep again. The next morning, I woke up and looked around outside. I found the spot where the lightning struck I knew that was the spot because all that was there was the stump of a freshly destroyed tree. It was no more than 10 yards from my tent. The explosion I heard the night before was the tree turning to splinters from the lightning strike. I went hiking with the scouts on a weekend trip. Of course, no one brought near enough water. On the way up to our camp, we spotted a stream to double back to after we set up camp to get some water. We head out with our bottles and filtration, just me and a leader, and about seven other boys. We find the stream. It gets dark as we fill up. The flashlights come on and about 45 minutes after sunset, we start hearing really strange noises. 
I knew it was deer making some really weird sounding calls, but nothing harmful. The scouts, on the other hand, were freaked out. I told them it was up to them to head back to camp or stay out longer to top off their canteens. They chose to head back. On the way back, I have this strange feeling that I should leave the flashlights further up the trail, where some of the boys are leading. One boy makes moves to pass me, but I grab him and hold him back while I shine my flashlight about five feet ahead. Rattlesnake, a five-footer headed across the trail. All the scouts are really freaking out now, thinking that it's going to chase them. I told them to stop, be still, keep the flashlights off of it and it would pass, which it did. They thought I saved their lives and were telling tall tales of their adventure around the campfire that night. It felt good to have middle schooler street cred. My wife and I were out camping with our four little ones in northern Ontario at Halfway Lake Provincial Park. We were tenting and I'm barinoid, so I had a hatchet beside our air mattress. In the middle of the night, I hear what sounds like a hand tapping the tent and dragging down the side of the tent. Earlier, my wife had taken our six-month-old boy and brought him into her parents' pop-up trailer that had an AC to breastfeed. She knew how paranoid I was, so I thought she was getting me going by playing a prank. I called out to her, wife? From across the lot, I hear her concerned voice call back, what? Throunded and fearing for my life, I decide I have to exit this tent to protect my three little ones. This could be a fight to the death. My heart is pounding so hard I wonder if a heart attack will take me like it did my father. I leap from the tent and position myself with a powerful flashlight and the axe ready to strike, and what do I see there sitting before me ready to end my pitiful existence? A frog. A frog is jumping as high as he can and sliding back down the tent. Keep in mind that I have come within 10 feet of a large black bear by accident on two separate occasions and damn nearly pooped my drawers. Granted, both times were after my pitiful frog encounter. About 20 years ago, when I was in middle school, I was on a backcountry backpacking trip for Boy Scouts in the Smoky Mountains. We set up camp one night in tents, not the stone shelters they have along the at, one night and tucked in. In the middle of the night, we woke up to a torrential downpour and our tents shaking like crazy. The next morning, we packed up camp and got ready to move to our next campsite. About 200 yards down the trail from where we had camped, we came across a swath of trees downed across the trail, sheared off two to three feet off the ground. It turned out a tornado had come through in the night. I was camping out at a secluded campsite, end of Kalalau Trail in Kauai, Hawaii, that's known for having a lot of squatters and hippies that live there year-round. It was about 3 a.m. and I was cold and couldn't sleep, so I got up to start a fire. I'm bent over and hear some rustling behind me in the dark. I shine my headlamp and see only a black silhouette of a person holding a large club-like object. I yelled who the F is there? And the person started stumbling closer into the beam of my light. I now see it's some dirty white dude with a huge afro hair, with a large stick in his hand and he's completely naked. He still hasn't said anything. What do you want? I'm so cold, and I need some fire, he says quietly, pointing his stick at the now smoldering campfire. I say, uck sure dude, come get some fire, not knowing what to say but trying not to offend him, the naked man with a sham weapon. He shuffles over, lights the tip of the stick on fire, which basically goes out right away, and then he holds out his hand and tells me, I want to go back to my bed, but I can't because I'm blind. Will you show me? How the hell did you see my fire then? I heard the noise. I'd like to go back. It's not far, just right over there, he points off into the darkness from where he came. At this point, I'm pretty sure he's on acid or something and is screwing with me. If he's high, 
I decided it's better to play along than tell him to F off and then worry about an angry naked hippie man stalking me in the woods all night. That said, there was no way I was going to hold his hand, or get within striking distance. I'll show you back. You can listen to the sound of my clapping to lead the way. I proceeded to clap and kind of nervously whistle him through the woods back towards the way he pointed. The whole time he's following me, he does this imitation of being blind by waving his arms around with his eyes closed. We arrive at this open shelter after about 30 meters, with pots and pans hanging from it and a bamboo mat underneath. As soon as this guy touches the shelter, he immediately goes to his mat and curls up, still button naked, and goes to sleep. Yeah, I stayed up the rest of the night. In the morning, on the way out, he was still curled up like when I left him. I was on the other side of a creepy experience one time. I was camping with my family in the swamp. It was the kind of situation where you had to canoe to the campsite, so there weren't any people around. Well, after dark, we were hearing noises in the swamp and got freaked out, so my uncle went to investigate. It is important to note that he just so happened to be playing the main role in Fiddler on the roof at the time and so he had a giant beard. He was also shirtless and covered in mud because we were in a swamp in the summer, and he was holding a machete because, again, we were pretty freaked out ourselves. But regardless, that's what the poor people who were just trying to pull their canoe ashore to set up camp saw charging out of the swampy darkness at them, a tall, muscular, hairy man covered in mud wielding both a machete and a huge beard, shouting who's out there? They jumped back in the canoe and paddled away incredibly quickly, and I'm sure they're still having nightmares about the mad swamp man that tried to murder them that night many years ago. Probably too late to the game on this one, but here goes. I had been working parkside in Denali National Park for a while and had a couple of days off, but none of my co-workers did, so I decided to go on a solo trip. I got a permit for Green Hill near Ileson and when getting the permit, the park service girl, whom I unsuccessfully attempted to hit on, asked me what color is your tent. I'm not taking a tent, I have a tarp. For some reason, everyone working at Sugarloaf that year was obsessed with tarps, and she says yeah, we don't recommend that. Who are you going with? I say it's a solo trip, and she says yeah, we don't recommend that either, but here is your permit. Six hours later, I get dropped off at the Isleson Visitor Center and head out under the Great One, which was starting to acquire some clouds, but the immensity of the mountain was not diminished. I waded across the Thoroughfare River and, upon getting to the far side, did a dance which I hoped the visitors at Isleson would see through the scopes. About a mile later, I was feeling like a badass a right Denali, I'm a woodsman and then I crested a hill at the same time as a grizzly bear. The bear just ran off, but it was about that time that I realized that I had taken the last bus out and there was no way out of where I was until the morning. Furthermore, at this point, the clouds had really started to sock in and I could only see the bases of the mountains in the Alaska range. I had angered the gods with my arrogance. So I said to myself, Brett says to me, a bear wouldn't go to a glacier, which I later learned was BS, so I made a beeline to the face of the mighty Muldrow. When I got there, the ceiling of visibility was about 200 feet, and until that moment, I didn't realize how noisy glaciers are. So I hide my bear can, get out my sleeping bag, and burrito myself in my tarp with that sexy redhead park service girl's voice in my head repeating yeah we don't recommend that. At this point, it began to rain, and I was convinced that I was going to die out there, and my fate would be lost to all of time. I would die, be consumed by a bear or the wolves that I had just heard howl, and no one would ever know. They would be all like, what happened to Brett? And a park service girl would say, I don't know, but we didn't recommend what he was doing. After a few hours of this kind of thinking, with the creaking and crashing of the glacier, a mobile home-sized piece of the Muldrow broke off and fell into the small lake upon whose shores I was camping. Going into action mode, 
I inchwormed my tarp burritoed self up the bank just in time to avoid the wave of ice water that came at me. Fast forward several hours and I was picked up by a kind woman running one of the private Kantishna buses who brought me back to the Aramark employee housing where I took an hour long shower, a gravity bong rip and watched the chronicles of Radik with my peeps before passing out, waking up the next morning getting baked with my boss and subsequently prepping, cooking, and then mashing 100 pounds of potatoes. It was my first solo backpacking trip. It scared me but also made me stronger. Good stuff. For years, my family would get together and go camping at the same state park. On these trips, my cousins and I would play in this great creek, build mini dams, and catch small fish. It was always a great time. One summer, We were playing at our favorite swimming hole with two other kids when a middle-aged man approached us from a trail. This guy was only wearing a dish towel around his waist. He was also holding his clothes. The guy began to talk to us, asking if we saw his puppy and that he had lost him. I was only 11 years old at the time and knew immediately that something was wrong. So did my cousin and our two friends. We told him no and that we would tell our parents to keep an eye out for the dog. I had hoped he would walk away at this point, but he continued to talk to us about this puppy. Then, all of a sudden, he dropped the dish towel and stood there completely naked. I imagine it was only for a minute or two, but it felt like forever. He eventually apologized, covered himself with his tiny towel, and walked away. I still go camping every year but this is by far the creepiest thing I have ever experienced. I was homeless for a week waiting for my lease to start, so I was living out of my tent in the northern woods in a small college town. To keep my phone charged, I would spend time at Starbucks, where I eventually got to talking to this guy while waiting for our drinks. We've both lived in a few cities with major Big Ten universities, So we were comparing some of the pros and cons of the big city college feel to the small city college feel. We get to talking about how we like our current city because of how safe it is, and as he's walking out the door, he turns to me and says, except for all of the unsolved murders recently. And that's it, not another word out of his mouth, and away he went. Well, whatever, that was weird. So I don't think anything about it for a while and come dusk, I pack up my things and head out to my camping spot for the night. It's been a while since I've been there last, but I have a clear destination of where I'd like to set up for the night, it's just above a small pond up on the rocks where a lot of the animals in the area come to drink. It's closing quickly on dark when I get going on the trail, as it really isn't a far walk. There are three trails from the parking lot, and I chose the wrong path. After 20 minutes of a loop around the far side of this pond, I came across the campsite I had remembered. Relieved, I start setting up my tent with the only light coming from my headlamp and the full moon illuminating the clear nighttime sky. I look a few yards behind me closer to the water and my heart drops there is scattered, shredded debris from a previous campsite. A full tent with a collapsed tent has poles jetting in every direction with huge rips in the lining. Clothes are thrown in every direction. A fallen over camp chair laying on its side, and a small two burner grill left out on the rocks. That's when I remember those closing words from the guy at Starbucks, and now I'm thinking, this is where one of those murders took place. By this point, it's pitch black in the woods and I've already set up my campsite. I know that if I try and trek back to my car, I'm going to end up lost, so I swallowed my fear and camped there for the rest of the night. It ended up storming pretty badly, maybe two hours after I set up camp, which only made it harder to sleep. I ended up getting maybe an hour of sleep that night, and when the sun came up, I packed everything up and was gone as quickly as I could. I survived the night and haven't heard any stories about that area involving any murders, so chances are it was just some drunk college students who left their gear behind. But the words from that old man were enough to scare the living s out of me.
A few years ago, I did a canoe trek across Upper and Lower Saranac Lake in the Adirondacks. The whole trek was 52 miles and took about 9 days. Each night we would sleep on islands on the lake, and some were barely the size of the tent. There were 10 of us, so since we didn't all fit on the island, me and my canoe crew set up our tent and then went to the other island to go eat. After we got back from eating, we found a deer skull propped up on a stick directly in front of our tent facing it. At first we thought it was one of the other crew members trying to scare us, but the same thing happened to their tent on the other island. On a trek like this, supplies are very limited and we are barely on the mainland. This was around the 6th or 7th day, so it was pretty obvious that nobody in our trek group would have carried not one but two deer skulls and been able to sneak away to set them up. It was pretty unsettling. During my time in the Boy Scouts, I went to a summer camp almost every year. One year, while at camp, I was doing the Wilderness Survival Merit Badge. For this merit badge, you had to create your own shelter and fire and last for a night with only you and two other scouts. At about 2 am, I felt the urge to make use of a tree and I left our lean-to shelter. When I got out and looked into the darkness, I saw two bright glowing eyes about two meters away from our camp. They were swaying and looking right at me. I froze and then called out to the other two scouts that were with me. They got out of our lean-to and also froze when they saw the eyes. We scrambled back into our makeshift shelter and stayed awake until dawn. When we got up at dawn, we crept outside and checked where we saw the eyes. There was a branch that had splotches of glowing fungi on it that were swaying in the wind. That moment was the scariest moment of my life, and fungus was the cause. A group of us decided to go camp in the mountains on a whim. We weren't totally prepared but we had the essentials for a few nights of mountain weather. Coats, bedding, food, booze, and of course my giant eight-person tent. By the time we gathered up everything and drove to what was nearly the top of the mountain, it was starting to get dark. We left our headlights on to set up camp under some large pine trees and then turned them off when we were satisfied with our own little piece of paradise. After an hour or so of drinking and enjoying the silent, wind-free night, we were all exhausted and turned in for the night. Several hours later, just as it was beginning to get light in the mountains, I sat bolt upright in the tent, being startled from my sleep. My friends were still passed out and I thought maybe I experienced a nightmare as I usually don't remember them. I sat there for several minutes in utter silence, straining my ears to hear every sound. There was the smallest rustle outside the tent, probably 30 feet away. I strained my ears even more, suddenly realizing I could hear my own heartbeat getting louder. Was there a bear? Someone out there sneaking around? Are we going to get murdered? I had to find out. I begin to slowly move towards the zipper door of the tent, feeling the rain tarp crinkle below me. Wham! Something hit the tent from the outside with such a sudden noise that I fell back on my ass and woke up my friend. I hear something moving fast, headed away from the tent. I finally tear open the tent door to see nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's dead silent again and there isn't an animal or person in sight. My friends are all awake now and wondering what is going on. I try to explain to them what I heard outside and we went to search the campground for any signs of intruders. We find nothing. Still a little bit freaked out, we decide to just enjoy our trip and keep an eye out on the woods around us. A few hours later, it was time for breakfast so we all sat down around the fire to eat. As I'm eating I see a flash of movement out of the corner of my eye, just behind the tent which was about 20 feet away. I slowly get up and start walking towards the tent, keeping my eyes peeled. Just as I begin to round the side of the tent. Wham! The same noise from before, something hitting the tent hard. Then I see a pine cone rolling away from the other side of the tent and in a split second realize exactly what was going on. 
I look up into the trees above us and look directly into the eyes of the intruder. Staring back at me, way up in the tree, is a squirrel. Asshole had been dropping pine cones on our tent from about 30 feet up. That sneaky rustling I heard earlier? Another squirrel, scurrying away from the tent when it was hit with a pine cone. I was made fun of for the rest of the trip and still have a grudge against those damn squirrels. A firefighter who was helping us at the training op told me about a call he'd gone on, supposedly to help rescue a kid from an absolutely massive tree. He said they didn't give him details, just that they needed him to come out and help because they lacked the proper equipment. He'd been called out specifically because this thing was so huge that the SARs didn't feel safe trying to climb it. He'd been a tree trimmer before joining the VFD, so it was easy enough for him to grab his old equipment and come help out. He was let out about two miles, and the team stopped at one of the biggest trees in the area and pointed up. He laughed and asked the op captain how the kid had gotten up there, made some joke about the old cat in a tree thing, but the captain just shook his head and told him to get up there and get the kid down. He said he knew something was up, but he didn't push it. He said that as he climbed this tree, he started wondering if they were playing a prank on him. There was no way this kid should have been able to climb this thing. It was massive at the base, but about halfway up it started tapering, and I almost had to turn back a few times because I really didn't think it was gonna hold me. But he said he kept going, and when he was just about at the top, he saw a flash of blue in the branches. I saw the kid's shirt sort of caught in a branch, and I called out to him and told him to come near me if he could, but he didn't say anything. I kept moving, calling the kid's name and telling him not to be scared, that I was there to help him. By the time I got to him, I knew he wasn't gonna answer me. I found him, or what was left of him, cradled in the fork of a branch, and the fact that he was up there was sheer luck. If he'd fallen any other way, he'd have come crashing down. It wouldn't have mattered though, because this kid was dead long before he ended up in that tree. I don't know who put him there, or how, or why, but it was sick. Kid's intestines had popped out of his mouth, and were hanging in the branches. It was like some sick Christmas tree, the way they were draped all over everything. I got a better look and saw they'd even popped out of his ass, his guts were hanging out the bottom of his pants. His eyes were gone, I assume shoved out from whatever force caused him to pop like a stress ball. You ever seen a body that's been floating in water for a long time, how their tongues kind of swell up and stick out? His was like that. I remember because there were flies crawling all over it. I think I must have gone into shock, because. Man I just pushed that kid down with a stick I broke off a branch. Just kind of poked him until he fell. I don't know why I did that. I almost lost my job because of that. But man the thought of hauling the kid down over my shoulder the whole way, gathering his guts up and coiling them around me like rope so they wouldn't get snagged. I couldn't do it. I've seen a lot of dead kids more than I'd ever admit. I've seen a kid who hid in a full bathtub during a house fire, boiled him alive, turned him into literal soup. But this, I don't know what did this, but the thought of touching the kid's body made me feel like I was gonna lose my mind. I heard him hit the ground and I figured everyone would freak out, but they knew he was dead when they sent me up there. They didn't say anything, but they didn't shout or freak out or anything. I got to the bottom and I started to get up in the captain's face, asking him who he thought he was sending me up there when they knew damn well the kid was dead. But he just told me it was none of my concern, and thanked me for getting the evidence down. I remember he said that, I remember it specifically because it was so weird to hear it phrased that way. The evidence. Like he wasn't even a person. Like he'd never been a little kid who got lost and had something unspeakable happen to him. The captain had a crew lead me back out of the woods, but he and two others stayed behind, and I thought that was weird. Why wouldn't they have me help get the kid out? I tried asking but the guys leading me out just told me they couldn't discuss an open case. I asked him what he thought had happened to the kid, and he got really pensive and thought about it for a bit. I would have said a crush injury, based on how his guts came out like that, 
But with those injuries you see massive contusions under the skin, obvious trauma. This wasn't like that. It was almost like that kid got caught in a big vacuum and had his gut sucked out. But even then, there was no trauma. None at all. It bothers me, man. It bothers the hell out of me. One of the vets at the training op reads no sleep, and he recognized my stories. He knows me pretty well, and we've swapped stories before. He asked if he could share something he's noticed about the stairs, and some thoughts he had. I'm really glad you decided to share these. I think it's important that people be aware of what's out there, especially since the Forest Service is doing such a good job at covering it all up. I asked him what he meant. What do you mean? What do I mean? The lack of any kind of media attention? No coverage of missing kids, or bodies found miles from where they got lost in the first place. David Paulide hit this right on the head, the FS is doing everything they can to keep people coming here, even if it isn't safe. I mean, to be fair, it's not like these things happen every day. But the numbers add up, and it's worth looking into. Especially the stairs. I was surprised you didn't mention the flipped ones. I didn't know what he was talking about, I couldn't remember him ever talking about something like that. He seemed somewhat incredulous. Dude, I can't believe you've been on this long without seeing them. No one told you about them. I shrugged and asked him to elaborate. Well there's the normal stairs, the ones that pop up when we're out of ways. I know you know about them. But sometimes I've run across ones that are flipped upside down. I guess it would be like if you had a doll house, and the stairs were a separate piece. Now take that, flip it upside down so the top step is stuck in the dirt, and put it out in the woods. They're like that. I don't see them as often but they're odd, to say the least. Makes me think of footage taken after a tornado, when houses are all blown apart and random things are left standing, like chimneys and garden walls. Those ones freak me out more than the normal ones because I can't really write those off as easily. I don't scare very easily, like most of us who work out here, but that idea stuck with me, and it bothers me. I'm going to try and find more out about them. He also mentioned how many people were bothered by the guy with no face. He got really excited and told me he'd seen something similar. I was out on a training exercise a few years ago. I was camped out in my tent and I heard someone walking around outside of camp. We're told not to wander far, which you know, so I wondered if maybe it was a rookie who'd gotten up to pee and couldn't find his way back. Remember that guy in our group a few years back who almost fell up the damn mountain? Well I'm paranoid about that happening again, so I got up to see what was going on. I went to the edge of camp and I called to whoever it was and told them that camp was this way. But they kept going back out into the woods, so I went after them. I know it was stupid but I was half asleep and I just really didn't want to deal with some idiot getting hurt. I followed this thing on a dead straight course for about a mile, and then it stopped on the edge of a little river. I could see the outline of it because the water was reflecting the moon, and it looked just like an ordinary guy. He had a pack on, and it looked like he was facing me. I asked if he was okay, if he needed help, and he cocked his head like he didn't understand me. I always have my pocket knife on me, and it's got a little thumb light attached to it, so I turned that on and lit up his chest, so I wouldn't blind him. He was breathing slow and deep, so I wondered if he was sleepwalking. I went closer and asked him again if he was okay. I moved the light up, and something didn't seem right, so I stopped. He kept breathing in this real slow, deep breaths, and I sort of figured out gradually that that's what was bothering me. It was like he was pretending to breathe, but not actually doing it. His breaths were too even and deep, and all his movements were exaggerated, like his shoulders going up and his chest moving. I told him to identify himself, and he made this muffled noise. I moved the light up and I shit you not, this guy had no face. Just smooth skin. I freaked out, and I sort of fumbled my light, but I saw him move toward me but he didn't actually move. I don't know how to explain it, but one second he was at the edge of the river and the next he was five feet from me. I never looked away or blinked, it was like he moved so fast my brain couldn't keep up. I tripped and fell on my ass and I could see this line open up on his throat. It stretched up to his ears, 
and his head tilted back and he smiled at me with his throat. There wasn't any blood, just this gaping dark hole, and I swear he smiled at me with this gash in his throat. I got up and I ran as fast as I could back to camp. I couldn't hear him following me, but I felt like he was always right behind me, even though when I looked back I couldn't see him. I calmed down when I got back to camp. The fire was still going and I guess that pack mentality of being with other people made me stop and breathe a little. I waited by the fire to see if he'd follow me there, but I didn't hear anything else for a few hours, so I went back to bed. I know it sounds weird, but the whole thing was just so surreal that it was almost like I immediately wrote it off as my imagination. We were telling ghost stories one night before bed just to scare each other and poke fun at whoever got creeped out. Most of the time it's the rookies, but one woman told a story that actually managed to get under my skin a little bit, and I know the same was true for others. She said it was true, but then again, every ghost story told around a campfire is true. Somehow, though, I don't think she was making it up. It had that ring of truth that only really traumatizing events have. She said that when she was a kid, she and her friend used to go out in the woods behind her house a lot. She lived in northern Maine, where there's a lot of dense, unpopulated national forest. She said the woods up there aren't like they are here. They're so thick in places that the trees block out the sun almost completely. She and her friend grew up there, so they weren't scared of being out there alone, but they did always maintain a sense of caution in certain areas. She said it was never really talked about, but they always knew not to go more than a mile or two beyond their homes. The adults never said why, but it was an unspoken rule that no one ventured out that far. She and her friend made up stories about bears as big as houses that lived out there, and they used to scare each other by hiding and making growling noises while the other searched for them. She said one summer, there was a series of awful storms that blew down a lot of trees, and set one part of the forest a few miles behind her house on fire. Fire crews got it under control but she said some of them came back not quite the same. It was like they'd been to war. You could tell who'd really gotten scared because they had the same look on their faces, I think it's called shell shock. My friend and I said they were like walking dead people. They didn't smile or say anything if you went up to them, and most of them left town as soon as everything was over. I asked my parents about it, but they said they didn't know what I was talking about. Once everyone was told the woods were safe again, my friend and I decided to try and hike out to where the fire had been. We didn't tell out parents where we were going, and it was pretty exciting to think that we were disobeying them like that. We hiked out about two miles or so, and we started seeing burnt trees and stuff. I remember my friend got really upset because we found the skeleton of a deer curled up under a tree, and I practically had to drag her away. She wanted to bury it, but I didn't want her touching it because its antlers were weird. I can't remember why, I just remember thinking that there was something wrong with them and I didn't want either of us going near it. The farther we went, the more burnt everything got. Eventually, there were no standing trees, and it was like being on another planet. Almost nothing green, just brown and black everywhere. We were standing there looking at it all, and we both heard someone shouting in the distance. I panicked because I thought it was my dad, and that he was going to tell me I was grounded. My friend broke off and went to hide behind a big rock, because she said she didn't want to be caught out here. Her parents had forbidden her to come out in the woods at all, and she'd lied and told them we were going to a movie. I followed her, and we kept listening. I could hear this voice getting closer, and I realized they were calling for help. I thought maybe it was some hiker who'd gotten lost and needed directions back to town. That used to happen all the time, so I was used to helping people out. I heard him following my voice, so I kept calling out until I saw him running in the distance. He got closer and I could see that his face was all red. I told my friend to give me her pack, because she had a first aid kit. She made this noise like she was grossed out, and she asked if I saw his face. I told her to shut up, and I jogged up to meet him. I stopped about halfway, and when he stopped in front of me I could see that his nose and lips and part of his forehead were all gone. It was like they'd been sliced clean off. He was bleeding bad, and I saw that the knees of his pants were red too. I took a step back but I was too scared to move much, and he grabbed my shoulders. 
It felt like I got a shock, and he jerked back. He started babbling, and I couldn't tell what he was saying, except that he kept asking how long he'd been gone. He asked me where his unit was, but I just shook my head. He looked me over and he saw my Walkman and he screamed. He just kept babbling and touching his face, and I realized he wasn't wearing the right clothing. He had some kind of weird gray cloth jacket and almost formal pants on, and the jacket had these weird buttons and red borders on it. I kept shaking my head and I told him I couldn't understand what he was saying. I went to open the first aid kit but he just screamed again and said the only thing I could really understand, don't touch me. You'll make me go back there. After that, he ran off, and I could hear him screaming the whole time. When I couldn't hear him anymore, I turned around, and my friend was crying. I just turned around and started walking back toward town. She asked me over and over what had happened and who that was, but I didn't say anything. When we got home, I told her I didn't want to play in the woods with her anymore. We're still friends, but we don't talk about that guy. Not ever. When I started out as a rookie, no one had told me a lot about the job in terms of weird things that could happen. I'm assuming this was largely to prevent me from freaking out and abandoning the park. But a few months into my service, when I was still a rookie, a friend and I were drunk at a party, and he opened up a bit, yeah, it can get a little crazy out there, I guess. I think the worst are the ones where people die when they just shouldn't, you know? Or when we find them dead like 10 minutes after someone says they saw them last. They were fine when I passed them on the switchback, I swear. That's sort of. Like, take this guy who I found one spring out on a really popular trail. Someone comes into the VC freaking about about some guy who's lying in the middle of the path in this giant pool of blood. So we run out there, and we find this guy dead as a doornail. Which he absolutely should be because the back of his head is like mashed potatoes. The skull is decimated, brains are leaking out like custard filling, and a guy's old so you figure yeah, he probably fell and hit his head. Old people fall all the time, it's no big deal. Except that this area where he fell doesn't have any big rocks. There's not even any stumps or big branches. And on top of that, there's no blood trail, so he clearly died where he dropped. Now that's when you turn to murder, but there were people just out of line of sight with the guy. If someone came up behind him and murdered him, there's no way someone wouldn't have heard. And again, even if someone had, there'd be a blood trail, spatter all over the place. But everyone on the scene said it looked exactly like he'd fallen and smashed his head on a rock. So what the did he hit his head on? And then there was this lady I found in a different park about five years ago, back when I was upstate. We found her in the middle of a stand of big junipers, curled around the trunk, like she was hugging it. We pick her up to move her, and a waterfall comes out of her mouth, splashes all over my shoes. Her clothes are dry, and her hair is dry, but the amount of water in her lungs and stomach was phenomenal. Unreal, man. Coroner's report? Says the cause of death was drowning. Her lungs were completely full of water. This, even though we're in the middle of the high desert, and there isn't a body of water for miles. No puddles, no nothing. No signs of anyone else being out there. I mean yeah, it's possible they were murdered. But why go out of the way to do it like that? Why not just stab him and be done with it? I dunno, it just sits weird with me. A guy with Down syndrome in his 20s went missing after his family lost sight of him on a major path. That was odd in and of itself, because this guy never left his mom's side. She was absolutely convinced he'd been kidnapped, and unfortunately a ranger who isn't with the park anymore insinuated that no one was going to kidnap someone. Well, with that kind of disability. Not very tactful, to say the least. We wasted a lot of time trying to calm her down enough to get information about him, and then we put out an official missing persons call. Because of the urgency of the situation, him being mostly unable to function alone, we had local police come in and help us. We didn't find him the first night, which was heartbreaking. None of us wanted to think of him being alone out there. We assumed he'd just kept wandering, and was staying ahead of us. We brought out Healy's the next day, and they spotted him in a little canyon. 
I helped bring him back up, but he was in bad shape, and I think we all knew he wasn't gonna make it. He'd fallen and broken his spine, and couldn't feel his lower half. He'd also broken both his legs, one at the femur, and he'd lost a lot of blood. He was confused and scared while he was alone, so he probably exacerbated the injuries by dragging himself a little ways. I know it sounds awful, but while I was riding in the copter with him, I asked him why he'd wandered off. I just wanted something to tell his mother, to let her know it wasn't her fault, because he was fading fast and I didn't think she'd get to ask him herself. He was crying, and he said something about how the little sad boy had wanted him to come play. He said the little boy wanted to trade so he could go home. Then he closed his eyes, and when he woke up again, he was in the canyon. I'm not sure that's exactly what he said, but it was what I thought the gist of it was. He kept crying, asking where his mommy was, and I held his hand and tried my best to keep him calm. It was cold out there. He kept saying that. It was cold out there. My legs was frozen. It was cold out there. It's cold in me. He was getting even weaker, so he eventually stopped talking, and he closed his eyes for a while. Then, when we were about five minutes from the hospital, he looked right at me, with these big tears running down his face, and he said mama won't see me no more. Love mama, wish she was here. And he closed his eyes and he just, never woke up. It was horrible, and I don't like talking about it. That case was one of the first ones that really rattled me badly. Because of how badly it affected me, I reached out to a senior ranger, and who ended up helping me through it. As time went on, and we got to know each other better, he ended up sharing one of his own stories with me. It was disturbing, but it helped to know that I wasn't the only one affected by the things going on out there. I think this must have happened before you got here, because I think if it had happened while you were here you'd have remembered it. I know it didn't end up in the news, for some reason, but I think most people who've been here long enough know about it. The park sold off a portion of land to a logging company. And it was a really controversial thing. But it wasn't that large or old of a plot, and it was right after the recession, so we needed cash bad. Anyway, they were felling this plot of land, and we get a call that we need to get our supervisors out right away. I don't know why, but they ended up sending me and a few other guys along with the heads, I guess for power in numbers, to see what was up. We got there, and all these guys are crowded around a tree that they've just cut down. They're all pissed off and freaking out and the foreman comes over and says he wants to know what we think we're up to. What the hell y'all think this is, some kind of sick joke. You've got a lot of nerve pulling this, we bought this land fair and square. Well we don't know what the hell he's talking about. So he brings us over to this felled tree and points at it and tells us that when they cut it down, it was just like this and they'll be damned if they put it there. The inside of the tree was all rotted out and hollow in one spot. And when they'd cut it down it had exposed that chamber, and inside it is a hand. Like a perfectly severed hand. And looks like it's actually fused with the inside of the tree. Well now we think they're pulling a joke, so we tell them that we don't like being messed with, and we start to leave, but they tell us they've already called the cops, and that they'll go right to the media if we don't stick around. Well that gets the head's attention, so they stick around and talk to the police about it. Everyone is denying that they put the hand in there, and besides, how would anyone have even done it? It's clearly a real hand, but it's not mummified or skeletal. It's brand new, probably not even a day old. And it is definitely fused with the wood, you can see that it's coming right out of it. The loggers, they insist that they didn't put it there. Somehow, this fresh human hand ended up fused to the inside of this living tree. The cops have them cut up that section of tree into a movable chunk. Then they take the hand away, and the area is closed off. There was a pretty big investigation, but I know they didn't find get any answers. Now it's become this legend, and as far as I know we haven't sold any more property for logging. As you all know, I went to a training seminar recently, and heard some amazing and horrible things there. One of the guys I talked to while I was there told me a story when we were all around the campfire one night. We were both pretty drunk, you'll see a pattern here, and we were swapping stories. 
He told me this one, me and another guy were out on a field search because some campers reported screaming noises at night. So we head out there to look for whatever mountain lion has wandered into the area, and I'm pissed. We've had three of them show up in the camping areas that year alone and I'm getting tired as hell of constantly having to deal with them. Plus, I just don't like them anyway. They're a pain in the ass and they're loud and they scare me. Cats. Pieces of. I'm groaning about it to the guy I'm with and he thinks it's a real riot. So we're seeing all these broken branches and what look like dens and we're pretty sure we know where this thing is. I call in and they tell me to confirm if possible which you know just means they wanted you to step in and use that as proof. I'm not seeing any, though, so I basically just tell him to shove it, I'm done. We know that damn thing's out here somewhere, even if I'm not stepping in or inside its mouth or whatever. Guy I'm with wanders off to take a piss or whatever, and I stay behind watching this little burrow under a tree to see if maybe a fox or something is living under it, cause I love foxes, man. They're cute as hell. But anyway, I'm watching this tree and I start hearing branches crackling and it's coming from the direction my partner went opposite of. Now I've got my pistol, but you and I both know that's not gonna do against a cat. I cock it and holler for my partner to get his dumbass back, but he's too far and he can't hear me. I stand up and get my sights on where the thing is approaching, and I kid you not, man, I just about peed myself. This guy is coming toward me and he's back flipping through the woods. Like, instead of walking, he's doing these crazy backflips, and I swear to God he cleared every log and bush in his path, it was like he knew right where he was going. I yell at the guy to stop right where he is, that I'm pointing a gun right at him, but he keeps coming, and I just kinda lost it. I shot at the ground in front of him, and it was a dumb thing to do, but man I didn't want this guy anywhere near me. When I fired, he was about 50 yards from me, and as soon as the gun goes off, he whirls around and goes off, back flipping back into the woods. My partner hears my gun go off and runs back and asks what's up, and I tell him there's some weirdo out here hopped up on god knows what, and we need to get the hell out of Dodge. I let the cops know what happened, and I didn't get in any trouble for firing, but man, I don't know what that MF was on but I've never seen anything like that before. It was absolutely crazy. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.